Rich just knows everything. Yeah. The actual encyclopedia. Well, Wizards has a guy who actually gives Rich, like, everything. Like, someone give, else builds Rich. Can we give Rich the credit? He's like can the machine that receives Rich. all the data and stores it and accesses it. Rich, you're awesome. Loading. Video. I gave him full credit for knowing That's it. That's not like, a preview screen that I want. But yeah, I can't remember who it is. Someone told me who it was, and I was like, "Man, we just need to like get that guy. That would solve a lot of problems." Yeah. I want to introduce yeah, the show, but I can't like get it to actually show on my my second monitor here. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing as you are. Oh, okay. I got is. it. I got it now. Oh my God, we're here! Yeah, we did it. All right. Hello and welcome, everyone, to Game State episode 29. It is Monday, February the 18th, and today we are going to talk about Pro Tour Gate Crash and a little bit of the Star City Opens from Cincinnati. I am your host, Adam Winner, as you Ragsdale, and with me, as usual, are Glenn Jones, event coverage coordinator for Star City Games. Hello, everyone. Stephen Flavel, poker pro and magic enthusiast. Hey everybody. And Cedric Phillips, professional wizard. Good evening. And special guest with us for this episode is Jerry Thompson, Pro Tour Top 8 competitor. Hi. <laughs> so we are going to start off super quickly in Cincinnati, and then we will move on. The Legacy Grab Bag is going to migrate to the beginning of our show. So I would ask for a brief moment of silence while I play for you the song of the Internet Kazoo. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Legacy Grab Bag, Cincinnati. The Open was won by Lauren Nolan, is that correct? Yes, Lauren Nolan with Esper Stoneblade in a top 8 of 3 Esper Stoneblade, 1 Maverick, 1 Show and Tell, 1 High Tide, 1 Blue Red Delver, 1 Rug Delver. Cedric, you get to go first in the Grab Bag. Go. Fuck a top 8. 13th place, Tyler King. Goblin Charbelcher deck. We've talked about this before. I'm going to link it in the chat for everybody. There was a man who plays a Togs in his sideboard. Last time it was Tyler King, and he's back. Now, most Belcher decks, as you guys know, has 11 win conditions, four, four Burning Wish, three Empty the Warrens main deck, and four Belchers. No, Tyler doesn't need those. He has four Empties main deck, four Belchers, and he has four copies of Manamorphos instead of Burning Wish. And then, uh, you guessed it, 12 Atogs in his sideboard to go along with a Steam Flogger boss, a Chandler, and a Goblin game. Very impressive, once again, for him to top 16 again. Um, just spitting in the face of all Legacy players worldwide. By doing this, I absolutely love it. So this is we can verify this is the same man that this won. is the exact yeah. same guy. Yeah, the Chandler, the Goblin game, all of it. it. Literally same dude, just saying F you to everyone that plays Legacy. I would like to nominate that man, King of the Legacy Grab Bag. Yeah, the best at what he does. All right, Glenn. Uh, for mine, I'll take Terrell Boas on Blue Red Delver, who managed to top four. Uh, Blue Red Delver actually seemed like a pretty reasonable deck to be switching back to once Show and Tell started coming back out to play, and Jund is like the top fair deck because Jund is super vulnerable to Price of Progress, and Blue Red Delver has always enjoyed a pretty reasonable Sneak and Show matchup. Uh, it was the first Legacy deck I played because, at the time, Sneak and Show was a good deck, so I decided to learn how to play Blue Red Delver. So it seems pretty fitting just that it comes back... Uh, Terra wound up getting eliminated by High Tide in the top four. If you watch the match, I think you can tell that he wasn't really sure what to be doing in the matchup, like didn't know which spells to counter, which uh, made it very difficult. Like I think all of the games he lost, I actually think, were pretty winnable, depending on what lines you take. So uh, Blue Red Delver might be a good deck for the next couple weeks, at least until the metagame switches once again towards Tarmogoyf's being sweet with Rug Delver. Alrighty. Jerry, you are up. This show and tell deck looks awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It's just like so streamlined. Like all your pieces are redundant. You have a ton of cantrips. You get to play like as many counter spells as you basically want. It's just like you, you should be able to tune this to, to beat whatever you expect, which I really like. And it's just like mono spells. Mono spells, mono islands. A lot of islands, actually. I didn't realize that. All 
Alright, I am putting the show and tell list in question in the chat. While we wait, Steven, you may go. My favorite deck from this one by far was Alex Binax Blue Eye Control deck, which tragically placed ninth. Robbing many viewers of like a wonderful experience in the top eight. Um, <laughs> highlights from this deck, like where to start. We have like the one Blood Moon in the main deck, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense until you realize he has the Dust Bowl in the sideboard to like switch in for it, presumably, in the bad matchups or something like that. We have a 15-1 uh, of sideboard because you couldn't leave home without the second energy field, but also needed the first Ether Sworn Canonist and Vendillion Clegg. Pyroblast, Red Elemental Blast. Presumably, he put his fourth Force of Will in the sideboard just because he needed another one out for the sideboard. I don't know. <laughs> uh, just overall, this deck is like it's like reading good science fiction. Do you do you believe that this deck will one day come to pass, or do you think that it's just an illusion, like it's it's never going to get here? I think sooner than we realize, this is going to be one of the ones that's like set in the year 2020, and then like in 2014, we already have hands which can feel. You know, I I think I took the analogy. Far. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> we're, I, we're deep. <laughs> All <laughs> right, that was that was an acceptable effort. I believe you have you've pleased the kazoo gods on this. We will move on from the Legacy Open to the Standard Open, which was won by Eric Rill with Naya Ramp in a top eight of, yes, correct, top eight. Two Esper Control, one Bant Control, one Boros Aggro, one Jund Aggro, one Black White Zombies, one Naya Ramp, and one copy of the Aristocrats, which we will touch on later. I will link the top 16 decks in chat. I am not playing the Kazoo again because it is too majestic for such a thing. But we will just go around real quickly. Uh, what do you guys like from this standard open? And then we will we will transition out. Cedric, you may go first. Uh, I know that Glenn did a uh, a deck tech with Andy Ferguson and his black white zombies deck, and um, it seems like black red zombies is probably dead. But this is a different way to go about playing. You know, if you want, if you actually want to play Dross Messenger and friends, and I don't know, this 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 deck looks, actually looks like pretty good. Um, I don't know if like all the cards are right or if the mana is correct, but I think like the overall concept of you know beatdowns playing like Restoration Angel, which is probably like, I mean I, it, it's like arguably the best creature in the format just because it's so good on offense and defense and like being able to play some Oxidats, you can play four throughout your seventy five like reasonably even though he's only starting two doesn't have any in the sideboard. Um, I I personally like a lot of the things that are going on with this deck. Um, I mean we've already seen how good Messenger plus. You know, like Diagraphical, Gravecrawler, like that sort of aggressive strategy can be. Um, Aristocrats are pretty nice to drop, which is something that Zombies has never had. Um, Restoration Angel interacts favorably with what the deck wants to do, so... I uh, I actually like this deck quite a bit. I think I wouldn't be surprised to see this deck, like, get tuned a little bit. Um, moving forward, actually, be pretty good. The question is, is it better than the Aristocrats or not? And I think that that is debatable, because, like, the Aristocrats obviously has Boris Reckoner, where this deck can't reasonably cast that, so... Um, it's an interesting deck, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually pretty good, even though it's not really going to get noticed by anybody because of the Pro Tour. Alrighty, Glenn, do you have any standard open thoughts? Uh, I was happy to see Experiment Jun continue to perform. It feels like there's just one of these in like every top eight, and it's my still like one of my favorite decks just because it does some of the coolest things. Uh, and Ambrosio Morales managed to top eight with it, although he lost to the eventual champion in the top eight. Uh, Naya did not seem like a good matchup, especially for his particular build. He's like light on Falcon Wrath Aristocrats and heavy on Hell Riders, uh, which is something a lot of people changed at the Pro Tour and wound up paying off for them, I think. Uh, so uh, I think that Experiment Jun Experiment One specifically is like finding a really good home in these Burning Tree Emissary decks. Uh, the list from the Pro Tour I like the most is Arielaxis, which I imagine we'll, we can talk about a little when we get over to that section of our show. So I'll leave it for then. All right, Jerry, I know you were a little busy this weekend, but I also know that you enjoy viewing a deck list or two in your spare time. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I'm looking at all, at all these lists right now. I actually like the Aristocrats deck. I think it's like, 
a little loose. I mean, I'm sure I will read some Sam Black article that explains why two Silver Blade Paladins is genius in, in this mid rangey deck or whatever, but... Um, I don't know, yeah, I could definitely use some tuning, but I, I like all the interactions, and I think that the cards, for the most part, are like pretty powerful on their own, too, so... I don't know, seems sweet. Alright, Steven, do you have any have any thoughts for us? I feel like someone declared war on Stomping Ground for this tournament. And maybe that's unfair, because there are still a few Stomping Grounds here and there, but it's like, there are all these Esper control decks in the top eight, and then like, we have one Wolf Run deck, but it's a Bant deck, which doesn't even make any sense. Um, I don't know, I, I feel a little offended by that. You appear to not be alone, friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's an angry dog as well. Yeah, I didn't know if you guys could hear that or not. I might have to change rooms or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to ask you guys quickly before we before we move off the open about how much you think the open results from before the Pro Tour affected what we saw there and what we expected to see there. Because traditionally, with standard Pro Tours especially, we get a completely new wide open format. But for this one, we had two opens before the Pro Tour fired off. Good lord. And, He's, alive. He's alive. Yeah. And uh, I think, I know for myself personally, even playing the, the fantasy ballot, that was affecting my thinking, even though I was doing my best to, uh, to adjust accordingly. I managed not to do so. So I want to know how much you guys thought the open results affect the Pro Tour results and uh, why you think that is. Cedric, I will let you lead. Um, well, as far as the open results, like, for any Pro Tour prior, um, I, th I don't want to say that this is the first one, even though it feels like it. Um, but, you know, normally what would happen is, you know, for a Pro Tour, it would just be a brand new open format for standard or whatever the format of the Pro Tour is. And, you know, people don't really have results for that sort of thing. Um, I think this is the first time, at least that I can remember, that there was like two large tournaments before this um, before this Pro Tour that could kind of dictate what direction the format would go in. Um, and it doesn't really surprise me that the Star City tournaments were basically um, like two tournaments where aggro, where aggressive decks, excuse me, dictated the format. Um, that being said, I'm not like I think that these two opens really did help dictate what people were going to do moving forward. Um, there was also Tomohiro Saito's Twitter account uh, that had a lot of influence on this tournament, which I'm sure we will get to when we start discussing the Pro Tour in depth. But um, I think that these Opens definitely did have an effect on what people would play. Um, you know, when you see Brad Nelson do well with Reanimator deck, uh, same with Brian Brondewan, I think people, you know, are just like, all right, I guess we have to play, you know, these stupid rest in peace or graph diggers cages now, uh, where they may not have if Brad doesn't have that finish. So, um, I think it has, you know, some influence, not a, not like a, you know, ridiculous amount, but I don't think that those are um, results to ignore. All right, Glenn, how much do you think your your open series influences the top level? Yeah, I think there's there's some kind of balance like I I was discussing in the balloting like that I thought mono red for example, which have been showing up a lot at the opens is going to show up at a significantly smaller percentage in the pro tour. That it'll still be it there, it'll still be a deck. And, like, those kind of trends tend to bear out. By the same token, like, blue is likely to be more popular uh, when you get to the Pro Tour than it is in the Opens. Mo or I should say more successful, because uh, a lot of players at the lower levels can't make those decks work as effectively. So I take that into account, since obviously, like, you're trying to get the decks that are successful at the Pro Tour. But it's, you know, it's difficult to map out. There are things you can't predict. Like, if you told me Cartel Aristocrat was going to win the Pro Tour, I probably would have just laughed in your face, because... That sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> like, and the, the deck that we saw do it is very different. So you, there are elements you can predict and elements you definitely can't. Uh, and I think more that beyond just general strokes, I wouldn't use the open series to try and actually predict what's going on for sure. You just have to kind of figure out which information will stay the same and which won't. Uh, I feel like we were all okay taking the fact that like Jund and Naya decks were good enough and were going to be very popular. Uh, and that's like an example of something you could see happening on the open series that basically transitioned to the pro tour as expected. All right, Jerry, as someone who has a long and storied history on both circuits, how much crossover do you think there is? Uh, just just to make sure this is working right, I did drop it. So yeah, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Cool. <laughs> uh, all right. 
Yeah, um, like we definitely tested with a lot of the open decks, like the ones that made top eight or the ones that looked interesting or whatever. It just so happened that like none of them were very good. And the human reanimator deck was something that was pretty good, but we didn't see like any of us playing, you know? And it did actually end up having a very good win percentage, right? It was like 57% yeah, or something. It did well. So, I mean, that's pretty sick. Like, uh, I guess that's just like Brad, who is someone who could have, in theory, been competing on the Pro Tour, you know, he'll be on the next one. Um, and like maybe he would have done better at the PT or like if he was cute for this, you know, if he just like played that deck and like no one knew about it. So I don't know. It's just like kind of strange how all that stuff happens. And uh, it definitely influenced it a lot. But like Cedric said, like Saito's Twitter account was probably way more influential. All right. Uh, Steven, what do you think? Yeah, I think it influences a lot. I think more so in that it sort of sets a baseline for the format for people to look at and beat than that it sets, like, which decks you can play in the format. Because I think one of the questions to be asked is, like, if the SCG opens are, like, defining the format, like, this is what you have to play. And I think that's definitely not true, but I think they're showing you what other people are likely to pick up. And so... Like, it gives Sam Black a pretty big target when he's designing his Falcaranth Aristocrats deck and things like that. Um, yeah, that's sort, of, that's sort of my opinion on it. Like, when I was picking my fantasy picks, I was picking Jund cards because I thought that was what was showing up in the opens and that was what people were going to play. But I didn't exactly expect the top eight to be all Jund or Jund to win the tournament. It was just like, this is what... A lot of people will be playing, probably not actually the best deck. All right. Let's move over to the exciting results of our Fantasy Pro Tour, which should give you a fairly fairly reasonable overall metagame grasp of what was going on. I will put my gigantic chunk of numbers into the chat, but I will say that in terms of overall results, our show winner was Steven, who was number two in the world, I believe. The, Very impressive. The official winner of the uh, Fantasy Pro Tour was Corey Burkhart. Uh, interestingly enough, Corey actually got two things wrong, where Steven only got one. But uh, the one wrong. of the ones Corey got wrong was like he got it less wrong than Steven, and it was the same one. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna. I don't know if we need to go category by category, but I will just run through the winners really quickly. I will say this could perhaps be handled better in an ideal world from Wizards because they won't actually tell you what won the categories. They will only tell you who has the highest score which makes it difficult to collect this data. Anyway, the winners were Garrick Primal Hunter for Planeswalker, although it was kind of close between him and Liliana, Thrag Tusk for Large Creature, Huntmaster for Medium Creature, although Boros Reckoner was very close to Huntmaster, uh, Augur of Bolas was the winner for Small Creature, and it was followed by Burning Tree Emissary and then Snapcaster Mage before Avacyn's Pilgrim, which means that the true winner of this event was one Cedric Phillips, who has profited a dinner. Suck it, Glenn. <laughs> yes. Instant was Searing Spear. Uh, I saw... I think the only person that I saw pick something else had Azorius Charm, and it was slightly lower. Sorcery is Pillar of Flame, although Farseek was close and Mizium Mortars did surprisingly well. Enchantment was Rest in Peace and it was not particularly close. Volcanic Strength was about 100 points behind it and Rancor was behind that. Artifact was Graph Digger's Cage, followed by Witchbane Orb. The next best pick. And then Non Basic was Stomping Grounds, followed by Rootbound Crag, and then about 100 points behind Sacred Foundry. So we saw sort of what we were expecting in terms of Stomping Ground-centric decks winning the Fantasy Pro Tour, except for the Mighty Augur of Bolas, which stumped all of us. I guess I kind of forgot that card existed. <laughs> I, I definitely didn't think it existed. Like Some people were saying Snapcaster Mage, and like automatically Augur of Bolas, I think, is a better pick than Snapcaster Mage, because like, every Snapcaster deck runs more 
augers or the same number as snapcasters in general. Uh, obviously, like, there are minor exceptions, but just by and large, that seemed to be very true. But uh, I expected more blue at the PT. I didn't expect that much more blue. That was definitely a big shift. Looks like you expected more Absence Pilgrims, too. Yes, I did expect more yeah. Absence Pilgrims. And yet... Uh, I mean, I imagine it split some time with Arbor Elf, but I don't think that was actually a huge factor. The the sleeper, the card I actually thought would win, like on Friday, I thought I was going to get daggered by Burning Tramissary because, you know, saito has got another deck, and I'm seeing what some other people are playing with, and I'm like, ah, yeah, this card's probably going to show up slightly more. And it did, but Augur Bowl showed up even more than that. <laughs> For those of you unaware, by the way, um, I'm going to take a moment. Glenn and I made a bet last show uh, over the small creature where if you've ever seen Glenn do a fantasy pro tour, he's a little bit cocky, a little bit arrogant. Glenn thinks he's a know-it-all when it comes to the fantasy pro tour. For the most part, he's right. I mean, it's and not he... just the fantasy pro tour. To <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, Glenn thought that Absence Pilgrim was going to be the small creature, and I think he used the words not close, uh, as you are known to use on occasion. I also use that term. Well, before you go too much further, you are slightly misrepresenting me. I okay. thought that the choice of Avacyn's Pilgrim was not close, that the EV of choosing it for this particular competition was better than choosing anything else. Okay. It doesn't necessarily mean that I didn't think anything else could win. Uh, okay. It was one of several categories I said it very easily could be beaten, but I couldn't actually pick what would beat it. So I'll just pick the one that I know will show up. Now, my choice of Ash Zealot for a small creature looks pretty asinine right now. That's <laughs> yes. not even close to the leaderboard. But when you select the field, as I had in our bet, that, my friends, is how you get a dinner for Vegas paid for by Glenn Jones. So, Glenn, when we do have dinner, I will be taking photographs, putting, them, putting them on Twitter, keep track of the bill, the full nine. Uh, to, to anyone out there concerned about me, uh, I did a fantasy PT draft also for dinners, and I won a dinner there. So don't worry. So I'm, bra I'm breaking so even on getting kind of fat. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> this feels fantastic. My birthday is in two weeks, and I will be taking you for all that you are worth at some <laughs> some restaurant in Las Vegas. So thank you. Yeah, you'll notice that Glenn got a haircut before he had to buy Saturday dinner so that he could pay for it. That's right. <laughs> and I don't, know if you know, I don't know if you know this, Glenn, but this is the fattest I've ever been in my life. So... <laughs> I am going to get you, and it is going to be good. Can I just, uh, can I just say, like, I, I don't feel super strongly about what cards people pick, but I'd really like it if people could do a little bit more with the name of their roster. Because as someone who looked yeah. at, like, almost literally every roster trying to get the data for this, please please put something other than my roster. Like, <laughs> but that's what, it's my Thunderdome. roster. <laughs> the Thunderdome. Yeah, the, the Thunderdome was good. There were, there were some. There was some dude with, like, the O2 drops, which I thought was, like, acceptable. And It doesn't have to be a good joke. Like, I just want to see some effort. Just anything but my roster, which was what my team name was, too. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to the Jerry segment, so to speak. Let's talk. Let's go a little bit in-depth with Jerry, who, of course, did very well at the Pro Tour made his, his first Pro Tour Top 8, and now no longer gets to be in the discussion of Best Magic Player without a Pro Tour Top 8. So Jerry was playing Blue-White-Red. Is that an acceptable characterization of your... Yeah, yeah, it's fine. You can call it Flash or whatever. I don't really care. Well, Steven, Steven wanted to call it Reverse Golgari. Like, that was his theory <laughs> from last week. Like, you name the two colors it isn't, and that's... But I, I suspect people would be a little lost on that one. I mean, it is basically the opposite of Golgari, so it makes sense. My shard, my team. <laughs> Rock yeah, Golgari. Rock, yeah, reverse Golgari. Won't you join us? <laughs> Did anyone else see those completely ridiculous videos during the Pro Tour? Yes, obviously. I went back um, and watched like, all my matches. Oh my god. So, uh, quick anecdote really quickly. Max McGall had to do that back end of the one for Demir, so it's like my secrets. My guild, Demir. And as I'm as I'm watching it, I'm texting him the words that he's saying, and he's just like, he's just like, "F you, dude. They, it's part of my job. Don't do this to me." That's awesome. Yeah. Won't you join us? Get a Demir shirt. 
So the Pro Tour was a 16 round Swiss event, 10 rounds of standard, 6 rounds of limited, is that correct? Correct. Alright, and what were your what were your records by format? Uh, I 2 won the first draft, and then 5 0 constructed. 3 0 the second draft, so I was 10-1. And, and at that point I was like, not like nervous, but like I was worried that I was just going to throw it all away, you know? Um, but thankfully that didn't happen. And then I went like lose, win, lose, win, draw or something. So seven, two and one and, and five and one or yeah. All right. Did you have a draft strategy going into the pro tour? Uh, not really. Like all, all the guilds seemed fine and I tested with the people from channel fireball. So obviously that helped a lot cause we had plenty of people that could draft and wanted to draft. And then Ben Stark, who, while at times a raving lunatic is actually very knowledgeable when it comes to limited formats, so uh, we had some nice discussions like on the couple days leading up to the Pro Tour, which like solidified a lot of things, changed my opinion on a lot of things, but uh, that was all kind of for naught because I just drafted Boros twice. So, was there was there any particular reason you were on Boros twice, or is that just how things broke? No, I think for this format, the, what I want to do was just like take the best card the first three picks and just like settle into a guild that was underdrafted. So if someone passes me like a fourth or fifth pick gold card, that's very, very good. You know, I'll just take it and move in and see what happens. Because I think that overall, if you're in the underdrafted one, your deck's going to end up better on average. And I see a lot of people like kind of doing that strategy, but like hedging, they'll take like a mono white card over a black white card or something. And then like, you know, you, you end up being in, Oros or Orza, but like your deck is just mediocre, you know, like um, not to pick on anyone or anything, but Calcano was one of the people that was like, yeah, first pick in Angelic Edict and just like, see how it goes. And I'm just like, yeah, don't, don't do that. I don't want that. I would rather have my deck end up like 17 playables as long as they're all good. So uh, in, in the first draft, uh, it was a seven man pod because apparently a lot of people didn't show up. <laughs> kind of weird. Like, they registered and then didn't make it or something, so they had to, like, cut a bunch of people from pods and stuff. So, uh, not only do I have the chance to get around one by, but uh, there's seven people, which, like, uh, kind of makes it better, because I think the decks are going to be worse on average, you know, with three less packs in the draft. And then I just got, like, a six-pick Sky Knight Legionnaire after being kind of, like, in Orzov, Boros, Borzov, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then after that, the draft was incredibly easy. I just had a bunch of, like, Wojak Halberdiers, True Fire Paladin, the Guild Mage, stuff like that. So I ended up losing to Lucas Chaklovsky playing Simic, who just played Clawfin Raptor and killed me before I ever did anything. So. All right. And did the construction or constructed portion go as you expected it to, or...? Uh, I Like, I didn't even really want to play the deck that I played, because I'd played it for two months, and it was getting kind of boring. But uh, Harvest Pyre is a sweet card, and it has a sweet interaction with Boros Reckoner, so that kind of sold me on the deck, like the fact that I got to cut Rune Chanter's Pike and play this like really clean kill that gave me inevitability against basically everyone that wasn't at like, you know, 30 or higher life when I ended up drawing my deck with Revelation or whatever, so uh, that kind of sold me, Reckoner was awesome. Uh, I didn't play against as many aggressive decks as I thought I would. It was, like, actually a gift that I got to play against that Jund Aggro deck playing for top eight. But I played, like, two mirrors, human reanimator, which is probably the worst matchup. And then just, like, a bunch of random decks, like a rug deck with Yeva. I saw that deck. It it made 6-4 better. Yeah. Yeah, I harvest pirate that Yeva. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, <clears throat> I know the deck really well, so that certainly helps. It ended up being, like, a pretty good choice considering the decks that I played against, and I don't think I made any, you know, like, game-ending mistakes or anything, so... I don't know, just, like, got fortunate to not be super unlucky, and, like, I ended up beating the human reanimator guy somehow, because he just boarded in a bunch of, like, smiters and duresses and, like, took out his combo. So, you know, just, like, things were very, very fortunate, didn't get unlucky and limited, didn't draw, like... My red denizens on turn ten, just, like kept drawing Ember Beasts and Boros Reckoners and whatnot, so it was cool. All right, did you have any spectacular anecdotes from the Swiss that didn't get covered? Um, I don't think so. Like, 
it was basically me just like bashing people. Like, uh, so the human reanimator guy I played against was Scott Barantine. Anyone okay. know him? Yeah, Rick Scotty B. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, so, Merfolk, the Merfolk man. Longtime Merfolk player. Um, I, I saw him three one a daily with like Naya humans, and. You know, normally I just, like, glance at lists like that because they're just, like, whatever. They're all kind of the same thing. But I was like, ah, I might actually play against Scott in this PT. So I study his list, you know, to, to make sure I have a good idea because he seems like the type of dude that is just going to, like, play a deck. Oh, I threw one daily. Seems good. I'll play in a pro tour. And then I sit down to play him at 4-1, at and one, and he plays a Woodland Cemetery. I'm just like, that's not the deck you've been motoing with. And then he accused me of being a stalker and just, like, asked me. <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. Like, look, man, I look at all the lists, you know, I pay attention, do my research. That's, That's about it. Oh. So how is the uh, the testing process? I know people are making a relative big deal of the fact that you were testing with Channel Fireball, and it looked like you guys took a fairly scattershot approach to deck selection when you break down what everyone was playing. Yeah, I mean, like, people like Conley and Kibler usually do their own thing. So I don't think that's too out of the ordinary. I don't know what was up with Juza. Um, like, it kind of hurt that Paulo and Juza were at GP London, like, the week that we were testing in Las Vegas. So they were kind of removed from what everyone else was doing. And uh, I know that they were, like, begging us to update, you know, results of, like, different matchups and whatnot and stuff like that. But um, when I got there, I brought cards for Nesper deck. I was like, I want to play Asper. This deck seems awesome. Probably beats the crap out of Saito's red green deck. And then I played some games against Shuhei, went seven and three. I was like, hey, this matchup's okay. We can definitely fix this, you know, make it even better. And then Raptor played four games, went two and two, declared the deck unplayable, and said that it could never beat the, the Saito deck. So after that, they built blue, white, red, and I basically ended up taking the skeleton that they built. Like, I didn't even really build the deck, they did. But uh, I was still messing around with Esper, and then I was like, oh, God, this green, red deck's like, almost unbeatable. None of our decks are good against it. Uh, Raptor had Gore Clan Rampagers, more lands, but he had forests. And I was like, those forests should be Temple Gardens since they can cast Reckoner, uh, which I don't think a lot of people for this PT realized. <clears throat> and then uh, at that point, the deck was like so good that it was like doing very well against like all the Naya decks that were trying to beat it. And uh, even like reanimator decks that had like Smiter and Decay just to be more hateful. I was like, yeah, it doesn't matter, whatever. And then they built the blue white red deck, and I was like, oh, well, apparently this, this red deck is not that good. You know, people build decks like this. So I started coming around to that deck as they were hopping off of it onto Esper. And then I'm just like, this doesn't make any sense. You know, you guys just said this deck sucked. Uh, so I just, I just, like, stuck with what I knew, decided it was a good idea. They all, like, tuned Esper. I tried to help them, like, you know, give them my two cents or whatever. And then I think everyone just did whatever they wanted because there wasn't really a consensus. All right. Um, I know you played blue, white, red. Well, first of all, uh, what happened in your top eight match? Did it go as you expected? Do you have any regrets about uh, that one? I knew that Joel was playing the same deck as me, so I was reasonably happy about playing a mirror match. You know, like I know that he's good and everything, but I liked my plan for the actual true mirror. But after I saw his list, I thought that I was probably going to get crushed. Like my game one match was good because. He only had two Izzet Charms for counter spells and basically had the same cards as me, except he had only 24 lands and no Thought Scour, no Think Twice. So in theory, my, my revelations were going to be way better than his. Uh, so I did win game one, and then he brings in four Geist, two Thunder Maw, two Negate, and a Jace. And I don't even think Geist is that good in the mirror, but that's only because it's really high variance. Like, depending on how they are able to develop their board in a timely manner, like, then it becomes really bad, but... If he just plays it on turn three, plays a trick every turn, then I can just very easily lose. So I felt like I was just like flipping coins post board, and that's basically what happened. Like one game one, game two and three got geisted, and there was like you know me missing land drops in there, him ramping up to eight very easily, still having plenty of gas, and then like him drawing revelations and resolving them, and me never drawing mine. So it was like kind of unfortunate. And then game four, which they showed, was me uh, keeping a two lander with like an Azorius Charm or two, and then cantripping those to find my third land, missing my fourth, stumbling for a bit, eventually stabilizing after I baited out like his Boros Charm and everything, uh, so I could Supreme Verdict his board, and then uh, 
basically like the only real decision I had that game was <clears throat> I'm attacking with the restoration angel and the snapcaster. Uh, and he's, you know, at a, at a pretty high life total. I, I'm just starting to attack. I mean, I'm at five and I could snapcaster his race charm to put myself out of like triple burn range or uh, burn, burn counter spell range, or I can keep my snapcaster for dispel, which also breaks up like triple burn spell or uh, double burn spell, I guess. Um, and I don't know. I didn't think it was very close. I thought I should just like play around his revelation rather than him drawing like two running perfects in, in two turns. And it turns out he drew the perfects and I just died. So, uh, a few people said something about that, but it's like, you know, they're, they're just looking at it from hindsight. I think like, Oh, well, if you did this, you could have won, but it's like, if he just draws revelation, like I'm just dead. So, you know. All right. I want to talk about the blue white red deck in general and after this we'll probably open it up and start talking about it in a more round table like manner but do you think that your deck is fundamentally different from Joel's deck? Yeah for sure I think like he has four Boros I mean, which yeah. automatically makes his deck way more aggressive than mine like either he is aggressively trying to assemble his combo where you know he gains infinite life with indestructible life linking Boros Reckoner or he's just trying to like burn them out after they manage to stabilize. But I'm trying to stabilize myself. Like I'm using my reckoners more as a, a of a defensive tool than he is. I think like he he just sets out every game like trying to kill his opponent, and I set out trying to not die. All right. And if you were to stay on blue white red, I don't know if you are, but which of those strategies would you prefer going forward? Like, would you stick with what you did? I mean, obviously, what I did worked out, but. Um, everything can be improved on. And like, I wish that like the morning of, I just talked to like Dave Shields and Matt Costa and like these people that I know were playing blue, white, red. Cause I would have gotten some good ideas from them. Like Dave had two Boros charms in his sideboard to kill uh, Garrick and Leon out of Jund or just like protect his reckoner from abrupt decay against them. And I, I think I would incorporate that. And uh, Joel Larson had two, is it charms first counter spells? Like I said, which seemed kind of bad to me, but if they don't know your deck list, like it's honestly not that bad because they're they might play around syncopate. Like a bunch of people cast syncopate against me in this tournament, which is very strange. But they might do that, but they're not really going to play around is it charm that much. And it's it's still like a fine card to have if you're digging for lands. Like I played a think twice, but it was probably just worse than an is it charm. So I'd probably like cut my rewind, play some is it charms, um, and then do something with the sideboard. I don't know. Like my my sideboard was kind of a mishmash, and I couldn't really decide on what I wanted for that tournament, which is kind of unusual for me. So I don't know. I, my, my article goes up tonight, which has an updated list with an updated sideboard. I like the main deck, the sideboard's still up for grabs, but. So you, you'd tune a little bit, but you wouldn't be like jamming guys into your deck and just trying to burn spell them to the dome, which seems like where Joel was more. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely not going to play Boros charm main deck. And if I play guys in my sideboard, it's going to be to kill other people's Geists. Uh, not necessarily to try and kill them, but for the most part, I, I like the plan that I had. I'm very comfortable with it. I'm not necessarily sure that's the right plan for anyone else. Like Glenn Jones, for example, is probably better off just trying to kill them, uh, trying to, you know, play complicated games. No offense, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me put on the thinking cap. That's that's dangerous stuff. <laughs> uh, I like it a lot, and it's... Like I, like I said, I was kind of sick of it, but now I'm not anymore because these new cards shake it up enough that makes it exciting again. So I'll probably stick with it. I don't know what standard tournaments are coming up or anything, but I like it. Well, obviously, it, it goes without saying. Congratulations on your finish. We're, I know we we on the show are very happy that you you managed to do as well as you did. So. Yep, you only took me 33 attempts, so not bad. Very nice. All right. Well, let's uh, let's start kicking around the various decks from this event. We talked a little bit about blue, white, red. I just want to make sure we get everyone's thoughts on that. Uh, it seems like maybe the deck that has like the most play to it versus the field. I don't know. Maybe that's an an unfair characterization, but uh, that seems like one of its main benefits to me. What do you guys think about blue, white, red, and which? Of the two blue white red lists in the top eight, Larson's and Jerry's, do you prefer Cedric? Um, blue white red, I'm not terribly surprised to see this deck actually kind of do well at this tournament. Um, 
when I was when I was I've been working on the format a little bit. I wrote an article about Nine Humans uh, last week on Star City, um, just how the format was like super aggressive, but things were starting to get, become a little bit defined on like what the decks were doing, and as a result, control players could start to figure out what they needed to do. Like, you know, the first two weeks of the format, it's a little bit difficult for someone to build a control deck to be able to figure out all the different angles of attack the aggro decks are coming at you from, but after having two weeks of results kind of flood in, and articles start getting written, and people start playtesting a little bit on Magic Online, you've got a kind of an idea of what these decks are really trying to do, and, you know, three toughness is kind of the number of the format instead of two, so Spear is better than Pillar of Flame, and people try to go over the top with, with four instead of three, so Mortars becomes better, that sort of thing. Uh, all cards that obviously Blue White Red can play. So the reason I think Blue White Red had a pretty nice weekend uh, for this tournament is because they could actually finally hone in on what they needed to beat, where they couldn't really do that week one or week two. Um, as a result, I think you come across a deck that looks like Cherries, you come across a deck that looks like Joel Larson's and Dave Shields and what those guys played, and you can kind of see the thinking behind the, the slots within their 75. Um, as far as which version is better, I think it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And, you know, Jerry took the the, the stab at Glenn there, but I mean, all, all, all things being honest, if I was to ask Jerry for a blue white red deck list, he'd probably give me one with Boros Charm. Um, because, like, oh, I'm. Yeah, you know I, I would. Yeah, I'm trying to get you dead. Even, uh, even you, uh, Cedric? Yes, even me, yeah. He would give me a list with, like, Boros Charm because, like, you know, that kind of fits into more what I want to do instead of casting Gives It Charm because I'm going to draw two cards and look like a moron because I don't know what to discard. Like, it's that, just. I gave you that uh, list for Las Vegas, right? The Geist Thundermall yeah. one? Yeah. You said it was yeah. horrible and you hated yeah, it's it. One, it's one of the worst decks I've ever played, but that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, it's just, you know, I, I would rather take a more aggressive approach and want to get my opponent dead than, like, play out a long game with, like, a lot of decisions where I'm not really comfortable. Like, that's what Jerry's more comfortable doing. You know, he's not really going to make a mistake. And, like, that kind of phase of the game where, like, I might make, like, a slight error and then it'll, like, put me on tilt because I hate making those small errors, which is why I don't play, like, a Delver deck or stuff like that where using your cards... Um, at the right time and stuff, it just doesn't really... Blue reactive spells don't really sit well with me. So, like, you know, it depends on what your skill set is as a player, I think. Um, I think that both versions of the deck are good, because both of them have Boros Reckoner in them. Um, and at the end of the day, I think that's what makes the deck so good now, um, is that that card plays defense and offense so incredibly well, and Harvest Pyre, Blasphemous Act, all that good stuff. So, uh, I do think the deck is good, and I think we're going to see it for a long time to come in this format. Alright. Glenn, do you have blue or red thoughts? Yeah, it's a deck that I've liked. It's one of the ones I've played on Moto more than others, uh, obviously, and I have tended to play the more aggressive versions. It's just, it is where I live, generally, and uh, I don't like trying to figure out how to beat their revelation with my revelation, and when I should cast it for two, or when I should wait. Uh, things like that are not as interesting to me. Plus, I love me a Thunder my Hellkite, so I, I can respect. <laughs> but I'm actually, I'm actually more interested in how you, act, how you spent the night before the top eight. Like, did you test? Did you just, like, get a good night's sleep? What, what was your decision for uh, your first Pro Tour Top 8? Because, you know, you've never never had a night before a Pro Tour Top 8 before. Word. But if I was playing against someone like Martel, I would probably have to test, but I've played this deck for, like, two months, and the decks in the Top 8 were not that much different than the decks okay. that existed beforehand. So the fact that I knew I was playing against Joel, I had his list, like... I, I went out to dinner, and then I showed up at the Mana Deprived party for, like, 20 minutes. I wasn't interested in staying, but I wanted to, you know, pop in and just, like, say hi to people and whatnot. And I just went home and went to bed. All right, old, fair enough. Old, so old. <laughs> I can respect that. That's, like, my every Saturday and Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Steven, do you have blue or red thoughts? Yeah, I actually think Empty Golgari sort of sucks. And I don't really think it did that well in this tournament. Like... Hater? I... Well, you guys didn't do it, oh. so he had no choice. Well, the, the problem is, is that, kind of what Cedric was saying, is like, you don't really know how to configure your deck. Like, all the Czech guys had, like, Magma Quake and Manor Gargoyle and just, like, all these off-the-wall yeah. garbage cards. And I, I felt like my main deck was good. My sideboard was, you know, whatever. Like, half of it was good. But I don't know. Like, going forward, this type of deck gets really dangerous. Do you just not like the style of it? Like, do you not like Revelation? Or, or what's, oh, what's the deal? No, like, I agree that going forward, this can become a, like, strong player. But I think right now in the format, where you have to deal with John Agra, John Midrange, Aristocrats, which, like, may not have even been on your 
radar for building it. And like humans yeah, build, zoo builds. Um, Dude, all the aggro decks are good matchups. It doesn't matter if they're Jun, Naya, Zoo, whatever. Like you, you play a Reckoner, a lot of those decks just can't deal. The the best thing against it is like pacifism, and then you have Angel and stuff like that. It's just like, uh, I like I said, I was very happy to play against that Jun aggro guy playing for top eight. Mm -hmm. I feel like the way the deck is configured right now, it does like very well against Jun and probably pretty poorly against Aristocrats. And yeah, static like, cast, if, if I had static casters, that matchup would be a lot better for sure. But as it is now, I don't know. I think Martel said the matchup was like a coin flip. But it seems like it's in his favor for sure. And then, like, I'm concerned about the non aggro matchups too, somewhat. I just feel like the format is too diverse for this deck right now. And it's like not quite time yet. I feel like, as like, even in two weeks, some of these aggro archetypes are going to die out. I think that the super low gruel decks may die out, the zoo decks may die out, just because I don't think they're actually where you want to be in this format. And I think as you get towards that, you can start to play this deck a little more. It might right. be... Go ahead. All right. Well, you tell me what I need to do in order to prove to you that this deck is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Top four of Pro Tour. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> I mean, there were <laughs> decks in the top eight of the Pro Tour, like, by definition, and not I all of them were blue or red. Right. Based based on my experience uh, from these matchups previously, I felt like if I got past Joel, like, if I managed to dodge his Geists and, and like, advance and play any of the other decks in top eight, I felt like I was going to win. So just out of curiosity, how do you feel like your matchup is against like Ben Stark's Esper list or like the slower controlling type of decks? It used to be miserable because you I had like one Pike and one Moreland Hunt and had to draw them both. But now I have a Harvest Pyre, which means I can draw any amount of Snapcasters or a Reckoner. Uh, and like the game goes long, we're both resolving revelations and stuff, but like I'm still dealing him damage and uh, he doesn't have, like, blind obedience to be constantly gaining life or anything. He has Devour Flesh, but I can just save save up to a point where I have, like, three Augers, a Reckoner, and a Snapcaster, and he has two Dissipates in his deck. Like, they don't have any real way to stop that, at least game one. And then, like, post-board, I just have infinite Jaces and cheap Counterspells. Like, at the TCG player thing that I top-aided, I, I got into the draw bracket because, like, some guy stalled me out, basically. Like, just played super slow, and I was crushing him, and he won concede, you know. And he's playing, like, some token deck with Revelation. And I, I thought about just conceding because I thought my control matchups were so bad. But I was like, no, his control matchups were bad. Screw him. <laughs> I'll put us both in the draw bracket and end both our tournaments. And and then I just beat control deck after control deck with, like, three Jays, two Dispel, two O-Ring, two Negate. Like, they're so, just not set up to beat it. So it's that they can't, like, drown you fast enough? to stop you killing them, is that... Well, I mean, they can drown you, but it's like usually you can assemble the Harvest Pyre thing in game one before, and then game two, that's still pretty live depending on what they have, but usually it's just like Jace, mill 10, is like gonna beat them milling you for six. Right. Alright. Sweet. Thank you. Alright, well, let's, let's move on. It'll probably be sort of a hodgepodge, but let's move on to, I think... The biggest independent story of this tournament was the Aristocrats deck, which obviously Tom Martell used to win the Pro Tour. It's sort yay. of... Hmm? I said yay, Tom. Oh, yeah. But it sort of came out of left field, and uh, it was there with Aristocrats in tow. It was obviously a white-black-red aggro deck with Falconrath, Aristocrat and various supporting cast. What do you guys think of the Aristocrats, and do you think it is going to be a force in the metagame moving forward in addition to how it did at this tournament? Cedric. All right, well, uh, let's see. Our next big standard tournament, I think, is two weeks from now, because there's Grand Prix Charlotte this weekend, and I think the next big... Oh, I guess Quebec is this weekend. Too. Yeah, Quebec City that. standard. Yeah, Quebec City standard. So, yeah, you're going to see a lot of the Aristocrats because it's the deck that won the Pro Tour. It's cool. It's doing fun things. It's got Obzadat and Falkrath Aristocrat and all these neat cards and fun interactions. 
uh, that alone is going to make, and that alone is going to make the deck seed play. It doesn't hurt that it won the Pro Tour as well, and I'm sure Sam will write an article about it, or Tom will write an article about it, what have you. Um, is it going to experience the same level of success? Hard to say. Um, I'm sure that, you know, Sam and Tom and the rest of those guys who played that deck on that CG um, probably got a lot of success because people had no idea what was in their deck and didn't know what they could do. Uh, and, you know, some people like Martin Jesus don't know, don't know how Exalted works, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but I think, you know, that deck is kind of interesting because it's super tricky. If you guys watched uh, Tom play in the top four, you know, he had a lot of decision trees to go through about, like, what he needed to do and, you know, like, what cards and... Wars off Charm is super complicated with all the modes he can have and try to set up a, a Boros Reckoner plus uh, Blasphemous Act. There's just a lot of decisions with the deck. I think the deck is pretty good. Um, I don't think it's great. I don't think it's going to be format-defining or anything, but I think it's a reasonable choice moving forward. Um, we even saw some lesser players, uh, like at the Star City Open tournament. I know that, like, Lauren Nolan, who obviously is an Invitational Champion. He's not, like, bad or anything, but, you know, he played the deck this weekend and got top 16. Uh, I think we had one in the top eight as well. So, I mean, this deck is going to see success in the immediate future. Is it going to be a deck that sees success over the course of the format? Um, that's a lot harder to say. Um, there might be something that really picks this deck apart, like a card like... Uh, Maybe like a card like Curse of Deathhold is like a lot, like a giant pain in the ass for this deck. You know, I'm sure that there's something with how diverse the cards are in standard. You can find a way to go about beating the strategy. Um, but for like the immediate future, the next you know seven to twenty one days, yeah, I think this is a deck that's going to see a lot of play and as a result, uh, a decent amount of success. Not only because it's good, but just because the numbers. Um, there's going to be a lot of people playing it. All right, Glenn. When I first saw the deck, it was actually kind of awkward because it's the sort of deck that I like the idea of playing, but I'm all, I would think like I'm trapping myself with it basically. Like it's like this looks like it would be cool to play, but I'm not sure that it would actually be good to play. Obviously, it won the Pro Tour, so it worked out fine, and its win percentage was above board, but not insane, which is a little concerning when you consider the fact that like 10 of the you know 30 best players on the planet are playing the deck, and their win percentage isn't off the charts or anything. But that's also just kind of the standard format. Uh, it does a lot of cool things. I think for this Pro Tour especially, it capitalized on it's the pe fact that people just wouldn't know what was going on, you know? Someone's do playing all these cards, like things like Cartel Aristocrat, you have to manipulate your play strangely when you're playing against that card. Obviously, any time when you don't expect a Falcon Wrath Aristocrat to come out of a deck is a pretty bad time for it to come out. Like, that card can just suddenly reverse a race in a completely unbeatable way, and when you don't know that it's in the deck, like, you wouldn't even, you know, catch that. So... I think that it, that makes it a better choice for the PT. I'm sure that was a huge factor in their testing, was they wanted to play this deck primarily because it had so many interesting things going on. And this was a good tournament for Knight of Infamy, too, I think. like I, I really like the idea of playing him in a Boros Reckoner format, especially since he attacks through Augur Bolas so well. So that's like two gigantic check marks on the pro side of playing that card in a deck with Champion of the Parish. So... I, I like the deck, certainly, in theory. I'm not sure how good it is. I know it will continue to show up for a while, it is the deck that won the Pro Tour, and it looks cool, so people will play it. Obviously, it showed up at the Open, and people didn't even you know, have the full deck list, I think. In some of those cases, they were just figuring out exactly what they saw. So, we'll definitely see it for a while. I've already seen it on Moto. I imagine it will show up in Quebec City, but I'm, more, I'm interested to see how the metagame develops with it there. Because uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's a deck that will evolve significantly. It doesn't look like it. Like Most of its tricks are pretty well chosen. Whereas decks like Blue, White, Red, and the Wolf Run Bant deck, those are those can change a lot more parts, I think. Right. Jerry, do you have aristocrat aristocratic thoughts? Uh, not really. Like I said during the open thing, like it it seems like it's a good deck. It seems like the type of deck that people will pick up, and it, it does have like all those weird interactions. And I saw like a lot of crazy stuff happening at the PT where it's just like. Like Glenn said, Aristocrat. Oh, I didn't know that was in your black-white human deck. Like, that's kind of weird. <laughs> okay, you're going to zealous conscript my thing and attack me for a million. That's weird, too. Oh, one, one of Restoration Angel. Where'd that come from? Who knows? <laughs> but now that all that stuff's out there, it's like, I don't know. If, if people want to beat you, they probably can. You know, Curse of Death Soul is a thing. Is it Staticaster is a thing. Uh, like, Tragic Slip is a card that wasn't very highly played, I think, but... I don't know. There, there are things. That's why magic's interesting, right? Like, all the stuff keeps changing. And you sound absolutely thrilled by it. I am. I really am. <laughs> Steven. I want to play my exact deck from the PT in every <laughs> tournament. That's all. The Aristocrats. 
I want to say first off that I really enjoy this list. It's like a, it's almost like an old fission, old fission, old fashioned take on deck building, a deck which is built like very largely on tight synergies and cards which interact well with each other, which is sort of like, I think we talked about this about a month ago on the show that Constructed has been moving more towards very powerful cards defining archetypes as opposed to synergies running throughout a deck list. So I really enjoy that, and it looks like a very enjoyable deck to play because of it. Um, it reminds me a lot of the Talawis Dark Confidant deck that we play a lot, Adam. Ghostad, back Yeah, but only I... one of us won all the time, so... <laughs> was that me or you? It was you. Oh, <laughs> oh good on me. No, this is, not, uh... this is not like an I'm lording it over you thing. This is like, I just... I just died a lot and was like, do not enjoy. Huh. Well, who's the dude, like, who's really the dude who played in Honolulu? Uh, no. Uh, ben Pe Goodman. Yeah, Ben Goodman, that's it, yeah. Ben Peebles Goodman. was there, wasn't he? Peebles yeah, he was, was there, there too, yeah, but Peebles. Goodman is the one I remembered. Peebles gave the list to Thingamajig, and then Thingamajig top eight it, I think. I don't remember exactly. Anyway, this, this deck reminds me a lot of playing Ghost Dad in Constructed, and I played a lot of Ghost Dad, and I played it for a long time. I played it, like, I think through a new set, even. Um, and so I have a lot of experience with, like, what these sorts of decks can do as far as tuning them, adjusting to the meta, a lot of experience with, like, what people can do to beat you. And obviously it's not exactly the same list, but I feel like it can very easily be a real deal for a long time. And I also feel like people are going to underestimate it, even after it wins a Pro Tour. I think a lot of people will pick it up and play it, not do terribly well, because they don't understand the list exactly right. People are going to play a lot of cards against it, which they think beat it, and they're going to play against an opponent, and they're going to beat the opponent with that card and think that the card beats the deck. And then, like, Sam Black's going to show up at a tournament, and you're going to play your Curse of Death's Hold and lose, because he understands the interactions in the deck and what lines you can take and things like that better than most people do. So I think it's an exciting deck, and I'm, like, very excited to see what happens with it going forward. And speaking briefly of exciting decks, I just want to say, as a bit of a sidebar, I thought they were pretty lucky at this Pro Tour in terms of coverage in the top eight. The games were, like, quite good uh, for watching. And I would say, personally, the game of the top eight for me was Martel's Game 5 against Efro on his Multi-5, when it was just, like, looked like he was totally dead when you could see Efro's hand and he went to five. And then it turns out, like, meteors. Just meteors everywhere, including in Last, your face. Blasphemous act. Yeah, that's like a very cute interaction with the Blasphemous Act and Varus Reckoner. Probably shouldn't work that way. Like, I know that, Jerry, when you I, did your deck, yep, you did I your deck deck. <laughs> I believe I said that as well with Harvest <laughs> Fire. You're just like, yeah, this is probably, I should probably be the one taking the damage from that, and I'm not. So. <laughs> I think that card is hilarious. I feel like there's like a, a greater than 50% chance that that card works the way it does because someone in templating said that we couldn't add more words to it. And so they're just like, well, I guess incidental infinite life and kill you with wrath of God. Oh, well. Yeah, it, it does feel like a little bit when, like, when you look at this card and like how it's playing out and everyone's like, Jesus Christ, I just spear that and take three. Or, but if they do something to it, they don't get punished. Like, is this what they meant for this to happen with this card? Or like, was it supposed yes. to be missed that? Or... I feel like there should be some sort of punishment for, like, hitting your own thing. Maybe I'm wrong. Like, with stuff, you know, with stuff you know, you have to choose a player. With this, it's just like, there's no choice. It's just You just punch it in the face, and, it, and then it punches them in the face. I don't think that's how it's supposed to work. It's a very, very dumb Reckoner. It's yeah. like, you hit me again? <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> So you think, like, some Stockholm Syndrome is occurring with, <laughs> with the Minotaur Wizard? Yeah, I just don't, I don't understand. I mean, I think the card's fantastic or whatever. It might be, like, bordering on too powerful, I mean, potentially. I mean, obviously there's ways to beat it, but, like, 
I mean, I, I feel like everyone for this Pro Tour, like anyone worth their salt, was just like, yeah, this is the best card. We have to find the best way to use this card. Because, like, you look at Jerry's deck, which is like a, like a control deck or whatever, and then you look at Sam's deck, which is like this mid-range, brewy synergy deck, and then, like, there's Saito's deck or whatever, which is, like, hyper-aggressive, and they all have Boris Reckoner in them. Like, yeah, I why just, not? Yeah, and, and, and it's not like that card's easy to cast. It's triple of a color. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, I don't know. It just... I, it's I, it feels like it's almost too powerful to me. Definitely good. Yeah, it made a case for being perhaps the card of the weekend. There. Um, uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt of that. Like it definitely was the most influential spell in the in the tournament. Yeah, I feel like, like so many not... deck building decisions were warped around it. Like Dreadbore like... experienced a pretty big uptick, and I think we can mostly attribute it to that. Like in Junlist, like. It's one of the more effective answers to Reckoner that doesn't lose a lot of margin against other hard-to-deal-with cards. Yeah, I mean, there's also, like, Pacifism and Victim yeah. of Night. Just, like, all these terrible cards. Yeah. People just have to play them. If you weren't playing Boris Reckoner at the PT, I think you had to have, like, an insane reason, like, not to be doing so. Um, like, you know, there's these Jun decks or whatever that just have, like, a ton of removal spells to kill yeah. it. I guess. But why doesn't Jun play Reckoner? <laughs> so they can play yeah. Arbor Elf and Strangle Rook Ice instead? Like, Owen, what yeah. the hell are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> it's not that hard to change the mana base. All these other three-color decks are doing it. I mean, it's I definitely within range. range. It can't be done. All right. It's well, really cute that Pilgrim can cast it. <laughs> yeah, come on, guys. We were counting on you for your Pilgrims to cast yeah. Reckoner in your Jun decks. And, uh... <laughs> did we get there. All right, well, let's talk about the people who are voluntarily not casting Boros Reckoner to play Esper and Bant Control. I know that I was expecting people to show up playing blue cards because it's a Pro Tour, and that's what people do at Pro Tours, but I wasn't expecting them to show up playing Bant cards. And uh, we saw some of both kinds, although uh, my impression is that there were more Esper players than Bant players. Uh, I know that we, I believe both archetypes were declared dead last week before they top aided. On, on our show. How the hell are you guys declaring Esper dead when it's like all over Moto and gains a bunch of cards? I don't I don't I, remember explicitly talking about Esper. I know that I, we didn't really like the idea of Bant. I feel like I probably said that Bant was dead. I don't think I don't think I said anything about Esper though. Yeah. How all dare right. you put words in my mouth? Well, your words suck, so sometimes I have to take <laughs> liberties. Cedric we just assumed. Yeah. How do you feel about Esper and Bant after this pro tour? I don't ever speak in hyperbole about decks being dead. Or cards being bad, okay? Not, not once. I don't ever do that. <laughs> okay. Um. So, okay. So, like, band control is a weird deck to me because, like, Melissa had like a really good weekend with this deck, and I don't think the deck is bad or anything. But I also don't think it's great. Um. I feel like if the deck was really good, you would have seen like your Owens or your um. Okay. I, uh, Jerry, what what did Reed play this tournament? He played Jump. He played the he same played deck Jump. as Owen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you know, if, if Bant is good, I think that Reed would have been, like, in the Reed tank. and would have been like, yes, finally. I, back, back I heard, heard that Reed thought Bant sucked. Yeah. Well, and, right, like, but that's because that's he still, like, had his Drown Yard version. Melissa's, Melissa's version, or, like, the French version, whatever you want to call it, is, like, way different than his was. Yeah. Like, this deck, to me, <clears throat> literally is, like, 58 cards that make Kessig Wolf Run awesome. Is what like Melissa's deck feels like to me. Like you know, like it's controlling. It can gain a bunch of life, and it's got rev, and then it can close games at Wolf Run. Whereas like Reed was closing games with Drown Yards um, and like Elixirs and stuff like that. You know, three months ago, um, and I think that's why her deck was particularly successful. I'm trying to look through her deck list right now, see if she had any other red cards. There's a Gazella in her sideboard, which conveniently only costs one red mana. Not that mana is really much of an issue. And then you know she's got then she's got Wolf Runs. Um, I think the deck is like. Fine, but I think like I'd rather be on the blue white red side of things, given the option uh, as far as like a control deck goes. And then as far as Esper is concerned, like this is a deck that has been seeing a lot of success. Um, I actually just got mangled by it uh, over the weekend. I've, <laughs> run, I've I've run into Lewis Laskin in uh, eight. Oh games. dear. <laughs> um, and he loves a Esper deck, and I feel like it's Nick Spagnolo on his account or something. Maybe I don't know, but. I'm playing Night Humans, and I'm getting them to 12 each game, which is not... <laughs> That's not bad. That's not very low. <laughs> uh, it's more damage than you normally do. Yeah, 12 is not much. So, um, if that's starting to be a thing, fuck, because I like to attack, and I can't do that. 
Can I point um, out something about Melissa's deck real quick? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so A, she has no basics. And I think it's reasonable to expect people want to ghost quarter your wolf run. So I think, like, that's just ridiculous. I don't know how you have the stones to do that, but whatever. Another thing is she has three red duels and, like, two wolf runs and one red card. Why does she not need all those red duels? She had, like, 14 Ravnica duels in her deck. That's just, like, unbelievable. And if you're casting Farseek and getting a red source, why are you getting a stomping ground? You already have green. <laughs> Okay. I, I don't. Fair. You don't need double green for anything. I don't get it. Yeah, I guess that's it. That's all I got. I'm looking at her deck list. I guess you don't need double green for actual any cards. No. Yeah. Does she have a? Does she have big Garrick? No. No, she doesn't. Hey, good point. I didn't see that. Yeah, it's like I know how to like tune decks or something. Oh wow. <laughs> but you're so smart. If you have a grizzly bear and you need to attack, who are you gonna call? Like. <laughs> That's me. If I need <laughs> to get my opponent to 12, <laughs> who I call? I'm your guy. Never beaten the Sphinx of Revelation yet. Since it's been legal, I haven't beaten one. That's awesome. Oh, can we get a ban? Just join the dark side, man. Uh, and believe it or not, I know this is going to come as a huge surprise to all of you guys. Frontline Medic? Not the answer. No. <laughs> yeah, there's a shock. <laughs> but their, bon their bonfires are dead. Like, yeah, were you aware? It yeah, it doesn't do it. It's a revelation. They just kill them and kill you. I, I, total surprise, I know. <laughs> Alright. Uh, Glenn, did we go to you for Esper and Bant? Did I... Uh, no, I, to, for the for one, I speak in hyperbole all the time, so I don't even remember what I said. I'm, I might as well be seen. <laughs> but... <laughs> I, I don't think we talked about Esper. I don't really remember that. And I know that the deck had been performing on Moto. It's the sort of deck that I like respect, but will never play. It's just like... Uh, I don't, I don't want to play those games in general uh, with that specific kind of deck. Bant, I, I really didn't like the look of it moving into this tournament. Uh, people were just seemed to be going on, you know, all these crazy aggro strategies, and I think the move toward Reckoner probably is, like, an okay thing for Bant, which I didn't really think about that, so that makes sense. Uh, but beyond that, I'm, I'm interested in the Wolf Runs. Like, they definitely change the texture of a lot of things that are going on, but uh, I'm not sure... Like, obviously, if people are going into the Wolf Runs, does that make Drown Yard better again? Like, obviously, Ghost Quarter is much really good against Melissa's deck specifically. Uh, and it was a card we talked about, like, a couple weeks ago. It was getting closer and closer to Strip Mine, which is getting really awkward. Because, um, like, the matchups where you're not using it and it's Strip Mine are, like, the red decks, where you would never want to Strip Mine anyway. <laughs> so that's kind of weird. Uh, so I think Ghost Quarter might be moving up in play, which might make a deck like Melissa's a little weaker just in the short term. Yeah, she can't win without Wolf Run. Yeah. It's, like, impossible. She'll be at 40 life, but she's just going to deck herself and die. Right. That, that was kind of how I figured it would have to go down. All right. Steven, do you have control deck thoughts? Yeah, first off, like, Esper had the lowest win percentage of the tournament of any archetype. So I'm, like, pretty comfortable saying that it's dead still. I... <laughs> Whatever. You're ordering. Like, <laughs> get out. Don't, don't like that. There are a bunch of bad people playing it, like, you know, have sure. to see a B team, Wapo Tapa. Like, sure. Like, all the way up I, to I 47 or whatever. I definitely there's something to that argument. Like, with the deck, like, as for control, obviously, like, the better player you are, the more marginal equity you're going to squeak out. And if people are, like, just looking at what's winning on Moto and seeing Esper and then picking it up without really knowing what they're doing, especially in a like meta where they don't know which cards people are casting against them, then that's going to lower the win rate. Um, so like maybe I'm being too harsh, but I, I don't think it's the best deck in the format, and I don't think it's terribly close to being the best deck in the format right now. And as far as like ban control, I, I'm like, this is not the bank control that I was talking about when I said that I didn't think bank control really existed anymore. This is like, a, like a very intelligent, I think, but it's a reinvention of the deck. And I think, like, when Reed is telling you that his band control list sucks, it probably still does. Um, this is like a sensible way to take band control, I think. And it's sort of what I was expecting to come out of 
play all the aggressive decks, it makes sense to start looking at mid-range decks, which can beat up on the aggro decks. Um, I don't think that this is where we're going to see Bant stay, though, just because this deck is it's, it's quite one-dimensional, and people are going to be able to take advantage of it, I think, in a number of ways. I think that this is the sort of deck which slows the format down by existing because it beats up an aggro decks, and then after it slowed the format down, you're like, well, shit, my deck isn't actually very good, is it? Like, all of a sudden we have three centaur healers, and people are playing ground yards against us. So I think it's a necessary step for the format to evolve, but not really going to stick around in this form. All right, let's talk various Jund versions, because I think that is the one that is most interesting when you look at the uh, archetype win percentage breakdown, which I've put up in the chat. If anyone is watching full screen, you can take the link to the coverage, but there are a variety of Jund decks that span the run the gauntlet from sort of big mid rangey I'm playing Staff of Nin and killing all of your creatures that you ever play decks, to the more aggressive Experiment 1 decks that we talked about briefly earlier, and they have very disparate win percentages and try and win in very different ways. Uh, what I want to know is, what do you guys think about Jund decks in general, and why do you think so many people play the big mid rangey kill all your guys deck when its win percentage is fairly low, and so few people play the tiny monsters coming at your face deck, much like the Ari Lax deck that Glenn mentioned earlier, when its win percentage is so high in the data that we have. Cedric. Well, um, I know that Owen did an interview with uh, Richard Hagan. Hello. And um, when he was sitting down with Rich uh, over the course of day two, he basically said, you know, the reason I played this deck is I was testing against Reed, Reed a bunch, and, you know, I could beat anything and lose to ev and lose to anything, um, but like you know, I was winning more than I was losing, and I had game against every deck, so that's good enough for me. And that's the hallmark of a rock deck. Um, you draw the right half of your deck, you're good against your opponent. You draw the wrong half, you're embarrassed. Um, and then you can sideboard into making sure that you draw the right half every time. And if you assume that a lot of people are going to be playing aggressive strategies and you have all these removal spells for game one and you can board into more removal game two, then you're good. And if you're, you know, and then you get paired against a control deck and you're like a little bit soft game one, but then you can board into Rakdos Returns and Staffanins and all these like underworld connections to let you go along. You know, you're giving up a game, but you know, maybe your win percentage in the sideboard of games is a lot higher than it should be because you have these really high impact cards, duresses to get them through, what have you. It's pretty classic rock. It's a deck I've been playing my whole entire life. Um, I don't think the deck was a particularly bad choice. It's, it, the thing about these, like, Jun decks is, like, they're super unimpressive, right? Like, you look at the deck list, and it's just, like, great. Thrag, Toss, Hunt, Master, Olivia, bunch of removal, a little bit of ramp, couple Planeswalkers. The numbers are all scattered, four far seeks. And that's pretty much it. There's nothing that we haven't seen here over the past, like, five months that's really going to surprise you or anything. You know, the removal is going to vary between Dread Boars and Abrupt Decays, and, you know, Steven Mann has dead weights. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. <laughs> um they don't kill Reckoner, and I don't know why they're that good, but whatever. Um, he has funny. those. You're, he, you did it, Glenn. Fatty <laughs> Reckoner. He's so yeah. little. That's right. <laughs> um, so, you know, like, the, it, it's all just the same idea, and I think, like, the idea of this is, like, you know, if I get paired against aggro decks for the entire tournament, and I think there's going to be a lot of aggro decks, this is where I want to be. Like, I can... And if you think, like, coming into this tournament, like, a lot of people aren't going to play Esper or, um, you know, like, Bant or, like, a pure control deck... Uh, like, you know, Jerry playing blue, white, red and stuff like that, then I think this is a reasonable choice. And you obviously see two people, you see two people making top eight. Uh, as far as, like, win percentages go and data, I don't pay attention to that crap because I don't know how to. I just don't know how, like, you can look at this. Look, I play with my gut. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Intuition is king. Like, I, uh. Like, you can, you can look at those statistics a lot of different ways and dissect them a lot of different ways uh, at the end of the day. Um, as far as, like, the more aggressive strategies doing well, like, you know, it's weird, right? Like, we can say that the more aggressive strategies did well, but, like, if you look at the, if you, like, look at the match that Jerry played for top eight against that guy playing Experiment Jund, like, you can just be like, how the hell did this guy, like, get this far when he's keeping Searing Spear five lands, dude? Like, he was 8-0 he was and then lost to me and Ephra. Yeah, right? Like... If he's, is he just keeping hands like this all tournament and just like, oh, experiment one into Stranger you guys in a Dreadman into perfect, yeah. like, in, in a perfect I don't know. Too. Maybe maybe he's the new Gerard. Maybe the the camera got to him. I don't know. Like, can yeah. can you explain it? 
probably no, not. I mean, there yeah. really isn't a, there really isn't a way that you can like can't really explain, explain that. It. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there isn't like a way that you can explain it. Like you know, you can look at the deck objectively and just be like, you know, here's why this deck would be good. Um, given what we think is going to happen in the format. And I think that, like, you know, Glenn, I'm sure you're going to talk about, like, Ari's deck list, because I, I haven't really seen that very much, um, of, like, why that overall strategy is good. Um, like, I think that that overall strategy of what that deck is trying to accomplish is a good one. Uh, I, I think the same can be said for the Jun midrange deck, of just, like, if I get paired against Aggrodex, I'm going to have an awesome tournament. And if not, then, I mean, I hope I don't play against Ben Stark and his Esper deck, specifically Ben Stark playing Esper. Mm -hmm. So, there you go. All right. Glenn, do you have Jund-related thoughts? I know you like you Amog Flunkies, so... Yeah. So, as far as the Jund deck like Owen played, uh, I, I like comparing the list, his and Owen, Owen's and to Steve Mann's, because there are some like pretty key differences. I think Arbor Elf being like the big one, right? I don't think Steve Mann had Arbor Elf. Uh, which kind of, I think, the Deadweights are like a way to offset his the fact that he lacks significant momentum because he doesn't have that ramp in some matchups. So that's kind of an interesting, I guess, deviation. But... I think the deck is attractive to people who, as exactly Owen said, you know, they want to believe that they can win every match. They don't want to sit down and feel like when their opponent plays, you know, their second land or whatever, they're like, ah, this matchup, crap. Like, they just want to be able to play. And, you know, it's the same kind of thing that attracts people to Esper Stoneblade and Legacy, I think. Like, they don't mind eking out small edges. They just want to be, like, reasonably gaming against everybody. And I'm okay with that. Like, that's a decision. Uh, I don't have anything against those decks. I've played them from time to time. I've avoided them from time to time. Like, just kind of depends on what the deck is in the field. Uh, I really do like the Jund Aggro decks. Obviously, they wound up doing pretty well, and it's been an archetype we've been watching on the show for a while. Uh, and its most recent evolution came from the who, Ari Lex and whoever else he was working with. There were multiple people. One of them finished 11th in the tournament, actually, Emmanuel Sutor. Uh, he's playing the exact 75 as Ari, and their list added Mog Flunkies to the lineup, which actually seems really nice. Uh, the Mog Flunkies are awesome because your opponents are going to be so frequently tempted to try and kill, like, whatever creature you led before the Mog Flunkies, thinking they're not going to take the Mog Flunkies damage next turn. But when your deck's filled with, like, Flint of Boars and Drag Manglers and Falcon Wrath Aristocrats, they're just going to take the damage. <laughs> like, uh, you can eke out a lot of edge there, I think. And it also gives you the more instances of the Nut Curve going, uh... Experiment 1 in Emissary plus Flunkies or Flint of Boar, which will just automatically give you a Wild Nacatl on a uh, turn two, and that's pretty sweet as well. So I really like what they did with that deck, and their inclusion of Dreadbore as an answer to Boros Reckoner, in contrast to the split of, like, Spear, Abrupt Decay, and Tragic Slip we've been seeing from other people. Their split was, like, Spear, Abrupt Decay, and Dreadbore. It gives them more answers to both Angel and Reckoner at the same time. Uh, I think it probably helps in their sideboarding, too. They, they have some interesting cards on the board, including Domri Raid. So uh, that that's a deck... I think their version of it is likely where you might want to look for... Uh, moving forward with Jund Aggro. All right. Jerry, do you have any thoughts about the many and varied forms of Jund things? Jund Aggro was one of the many decks that I tested. Oh, God, hold on. My my computer is dying somehow. It's not plugged in. I'm so stupid. <laughs> this Are we going, case? Got me. Are okay, we going on an good. adventure again? Maybe oh. no, we're good. We're good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was one of the many aggro decks I tested after uh, our deck started beating up on Saito's red green deck. So like, there was a dude that won a trial at GP London with blue white red, like mono red splashing guys basically. So I like tried that deck and then I tried Jund aggro and I thought the Jund aggro deck was good, but uh, no one was interested in it. And then I was just like, okay, fine, I'll just play blue white red. But I, de I definitely like the the Mog Flunky interaction. I like Jun because. Uh, you had things like Abrupt Decay, your your two drops were more resilient, like, I was playing Lotleth Troll, and some people have Strangler guys, but I think, like, uh, two of a certain color is harder to cast than, like, two of a different color, so. Uh, I know that the guy that I played against playing for top eight played Strangler guys, you know, consistently by turn four every game, but that's not, <laughs> <laughs> not really where I want to be. <laughs> good, use, good use of consistently. Yeah, like, Troll is pretty sweet, but I think Mog Flunky is definitely way better. Utilizing Burning Tree Emissary is definitely what these aggro decks want to be doing. Uh, I've, what do they have instead of, uh, like, another one-drop? They have Experiment 1 and Death Rite They have Rakdos Cackler. Okay, yeah, Cackler was what I liked. And that's what I picked for Small Creature, actually, and just got annihilated. That one oh. was not close. But I liked that, like, all of Jun's dual lands cast that on turn one. Yep. You should have picked Pilgrim. No, I'm not that dumb. 
Oh, okay. Cack Cackler was, I think, like six points behind Pilgrim or something. So if we go by that metric, you are in fact that dumb. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to tell you, friend. I think with Cackler in the Pro Tour, we're pretty dumb, and that's why they all lost. <laughs> um, how do you feel about the like staff of Nin John Dex? I know that Channel Fireball was super worried about them with their Esper deck. And from my experience, like, those matchups weren't that bad, but, like, Raptor kept j just being like, they're going to slaughter games your revelations, Rakdos return your Jaces, and you're going to have no hand, and you're just dead. So we need to play, like, Witchbane Orbs and Angel of Serenities and just, like, all this garbage. Like, granted, Witchbane Orbs is very good, but, but Angel of Serenity is just, like, I don't know what you guys are doing. You know, and like I said, I tried to, you know, give, give them my two cents or whatever, and I don't know if, if it was, like, awesome for them or terrible or whatever, but... I just know beforehand, I was like, you guys are overreacting, and, um, I, I, like, I know that those decks are good, and, like Cedric said, you can tune them to be one way or the other, and, like, a deck with the rest, Rakdos Return, Slaughter Games, like, basically Conley's Mono Black deck, uh, in theory should be good against Control decks, but it's, like, so much stuff, you have to line up so well with, like, Sphinx's Revelation, and, like, their counter spells against your Rakdos Returns and stuff like that, it's, like, so hard to come out on top. Especially if you're just, like, down a game because you have 14 removal spells in your deck or whatever. No, you don't. You just turn two, 17. Yeah, spear you. Yeah. All right. Steven, do you have gen-related thoughts before we move off? Um, I think in this case, the fact that the mid-range deck did poorly as far as one percentage and the aggro deck did quite well was just, like, the distribution of the meta. I think that the aggro deck was running into favorable matches more often than the mid rangey deck was, um, yeah, was running into a lot of decks that it couldn't handle as well. I don't think that's like speaking to the strength of the archetypes themselves. I think that it's just a matter of like who you're going to be battling against on a given day. I like the gen decks quite a lot. I think it's like a very sensible place to be as aggro and as mid range. Um, I think for this tournament, uh, more Banty take on mid-range was more sensible. But that's not to say that <laughs> it's not to say that we'll be for the next tournament, and it's also not to say that I'm right. Uh, <laughs> I like I like that Jen has so many cards available to it, and you're really going to have to look at the meta and try to work out what your game plan is in a lot of different matchups. And work out like is slaughter games, duress, Rakdos return actually the line I want to be taking against these control decks, or do I want to do something else? Like it could be that just the control decks having access to Witchbane Orb on its own makes a different line better. And all of those um, little tweaks available to you in deck building make this, I think, a very complicated deck to build and play correctly. So I think it has a lot of play to it. It's a strong deck which can be built to be pretty much everything in the field, if you do it right. Alright, and the last archetype of deck that I have down to talk about from this Pro Tour is the various and sundry Naya decks. Obviously there are a, a myriad of different kinds of Naya deck. There is the Humans deck, which as Cedric mentioned is consistently dealing 8 points of damage to its opponent. <laughs> there, <laughs> there is the uh, Gyre Sage Zoo deck that Efro was playing, which I believe comes originally from Tomohara Saito's Twitter account. Is that accurate? Yep. Yes. One of the many bombs which Saito dropped from his Twitter account on the Pro Tour over the the preceding several weeks. And there are various there are many different Naya builds. So what do you guys think about Naya in general? And I guess Efro's deck can highlight that since it is the one example we have in the top eight. And where do you think it's going in the future? Cedric? Uh, so, Ephraim's deck feels like more of like a Naya Zoo deck to me. Um, just like a bunch of different creature types, all really good for their cost, all super powerful on their own, um, and obviously when they're working together, just beat the crap out of their opponent. <coughs> um, you see he has Reckoner, he has Boar, he has Hellrider, uh, Gyre Sage, um, Smiter, Thundermall Hellkite, and he's got Mortars uh, to peel off the top when he needs to kill his opponent to get yes. to top 8 of a Pro Tour. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and then Dami uh, Rod, which is, you know, Diamond Rod is an interesting card. Obviously, it's good when you have 28 creatures in your deck. Um, it's it's super interesting uh, card to me, just, like, 
it's kind of a hard card to judge, especially because he has a deck, I want to make sure, that can't cast it on turn two. Yes. Yeah, can't. Okay, yeah. yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't have, have elves other than yeah, he does, Sage. He doesn't have Aspen's Pilgrim. Thanks, Efro. Appreciate it. Good job. <laughs> um, Got him. Um, yeah, good job, Efro. Um, like, his deck... Like, it's pretty clear, like, what this deck's doing, which is trying to give, like, the beatdowns, but it's got some resilient threats in it. It's got, like, a lot of haste cards in it, um, and, like, the, all the cards are super, super good. Um, Gyre Sage is the card that kind of interests me the most, because this card, like, really picked up in, as far, like, like kind of like Wildfire, just, like, how much people were like, this card's not playable, how good is this card, this card's insane in this deck, like, okay, why aren't you comboing with the Increasing Savagery now, which is what Ben Weinberg did at the Open in, uh, in Cincinnati this weekend, like, he didn't have that good of a tournament, but he's like, yeah, like, you, you know, Sage it, and then you, like, flash it back on the Sage, and, like, your Sage is gigantic, and tap for infinite mana or whatever. So, like, this deck seems like it's pretty good. Like, all the Naya decks are pretty, like, they're all, they all seem like they're pretty good. You know, there's, like, Naya midrange, there's, like, this zoo variant, uh, there's a Naya human deck that I'm playing, which, like, gives the beatdowns, and is, like, pretty good against opposing aggressive decks because they play defense, but, like, if my opponent plays a Zori's Charm, can't possibly win ever, ever, ever. So... Uh -huh. Yep, can't can't do it. It's not possible. Um, so I think like this deck's all right. Um, I don't know how many people like play this kind of strategy at the Pro Tour. Uh, I would I would have been a little surprised not to see one make it through to the top eight. Um, that's about it. I mean, there's not there's nothing about this deck that like blows me away or anything. That is like, oh man, like what a revelation this deck is. It's good creatures, Domirod and Mizium orders. Holy crap! Like, but it, it, that being said, like it still seems like it's a perfectly reasonable strategy. Alright, Glenn, I know that you've, you've rumbled with Naya Monsters in the past. Do you have thoughts? I have. Uh, I really like uh, Efro's deck and the decks that have styled with it. It's been one of the decks I've been following the development of uh, from Saito's Twitter account and other locations. And it definitely does a lot of interesting things. Gyre Sage is really cool in most of the decks that I've seen. I haven't gotten to play with it yet, so I don't really have a strong opinion, but like I like it in theory. And I like any deck that can play Domri Raid, because I think he's just a very cool card. And every time someone wins with him, I come a little closer to winning a side bet. So, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Domri Raid. Wait, do you have and, a bet that I don't know about? Huh? Uh, this is on our Above the Curve that we do on SCG. It's like the Mythic Rare that I am championing. What did, what did I pick? You picked Obs... Or no, you picked Aurelia's Fury. You're getting destroyed right now, I think. Yeah, I'm this PT was real bad for you. <laughs> Well, yeah. it's not just the PT. That card is is not playable. The format's, <laughs> the format's way faster than I thought it well, was. Well, on the upside, like, Brad has Prime Speaker, so you're not going to lose. Like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah, okay, can we just scoop this bet right now? Is that cool? <laughs> we'll just do that when we record tomorrow. Oh, man. So, uh, as far as Gyre Sage and the Nidex, and another interesting take that I actually saw among the top decks from the Pro Tour, or right, top is kind of a loose term. They have, like, six wins or whatever. Uh, Daniel Ruiz Martin finished 40th in the Pro Tour. Uh, that means ten, he got 10-5-1. And, and his deck isn't Naya. It's actually like Gruul, but includes a lot of similar stuff. Uh, he has the Increasing Savagery with Gyre Sage Interaction. He has Domri Raid. And he's using his additional green mana to play Strangle Root Geist and Wolfier Silverhearts. To just get really big and attack with lots of giant monsters. And that looks pretty cool, actually. So I think that we have not heard the last of Gyre Sage. I imagine... His role in the format, especially alongside Burning Tree Emissary, which is just shaping up to be uh, the little bear that definitely can. We're, we're going to see some cool things from this color combination. It makes me really sad that people don't call that bear amorphos. Like, I just, I don't understand, man. <laughs> You're trying so hard to get it over. I you mean, gotta, it's just, it's just you better. You just gotta let it happen. You, it's you just can't. better. Alright, two <laughs> things. I, I, I saw you, like, post that somewhere today, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cute. But also stop trying to make fetch happen. That's right. <laughs> it's not it's better. Not gonna like, happen. You're trying hard to get it over. All right. So are you are you just happy casting Azorius Charm and brutally murdering these people, Jerry? Is that your your stance on Naya? Like, yeah. Well, pretty much. I mean, uh, so Kibler's deck was like six to eight elves with eight duels and three forests, but he had, like, four Reckoners, too, and, like, deck desperately needed to nut draw every game in order to have a shot, but uh, I liked Efro's deck a lot better, and, it like, it was fine without a one-drop, you know, like, I'm not sure if you can actually get some sort of one-drop in there or whatever, nor do I think it would necessarily make the deck better, 
So it's like slower to develop, but it definitely has a lot of staying power. It's very good. It has a lot of like turn fours with Gyre Sage and uh, Mortars is awesome. Dami Rod's awesome. All your guys have haste and they're like impossible to kill. So I don't know. It's like no surprise to me that he made top eight. And um, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised he didn't work harder to try and get more people to play his deck because he was like confidently on that deck for maybe a week or week and a half before the PT and was just like playing games with it, but no one was ever talking to him about it. And they just built his sideboard the night before. I was like, whatever, let's go. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, in fairness, in fairness to Ifro for all the like, for how sweet it was for Martel, probably that he managed to win that mold of five game five, it was probably incredibly heartbreaking for Ifro. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, looked certainly. like he could never lose that game, and then Martel just like peeled on him twice or something. Like, yeah, I was I was on a plane when all that stuff was happening, but I'm definitely gonna go back and watch because it sounds like a lot of interesting stuff went down. All right, Steven, Naya related thoughts. Yeah, I wouldn't put Delver in it, but I'm putting Experiment 1 in here, so one drop. I like the deck. Um, in some ways, and dislike it in others. I sort of like it more, just as a Gruel deck. I don't think you win that much by fitting White in here. And I know that like the mana basis in the format sort of support three colors if you're going to play two colors convincingly anyway, but I don't know. The white is suspect to me. I also wonder if white is the best other color. Like, but if you're gonna play blue, nothing... you have to play Yeva. Like, <laughs> well, there's nothing to say. You can't play like one or two blue cards or one or two black cards here. And like, it may be that one week white's the right color and one week blue's the right color, and it's just a matter of who you're playing against. I don't know. There are a lot of cards in the format and a lot of weird things you can do. So, yeah, I like the list a lot. I think um, I think that the aggro lists with access to Hellrider and Thundermaws to punch damage over the top at the end are just much, much more appealing than the super low lists. And I think if you're not going to play John Dagger, this is... Oh, if you're not going to play John Dagger or the Aristocrats, this is where you should be. <laughs> High praise. Yeah. praise. You, you praise it as the third best aggro deck. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Solid praise. Uh, is there anything else? I will just sort of open up the floor. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about from the Pro Tour? Um, uh, I'll say something. Yeah, rock on. I. I did really like the uh, Increasing Savagery deck. Like, Shuei played with it a little bit, and it seemed like he would get into these giant board stalls with, like, all these other green decks, or, like, even the red-green deck. Just, like, anything with a Reckoner, and he... Like, the deck didn't have anything to give Trample. It was just, like, you know, a Saito deck that he posted on Twitter, but didn't have any Wolf Runs, didn't have any Rancors or anything, so he'd have, like, a 20-20 that he could never attack with. So, uh, Increasing Savagery looked good, and just being almost mono-green looked good. And I'm I'm gonna explore that a little bit if I get some free time this week, but it looks sweet. There was one like literally mono green deck, like the Predator Ooze Wandering Wolf thing that we saw like a while back that that was in the like six and four or better decks. I don't think that's what you're talking about, but there was one. So No, it was just like Saito's third deck that he posted. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, Saito, th three of six that Saito tried to influence the Pro yeah. Tour with. Well, he went yeah. with the carpet bombing approach, clearly. Yeah. Um, are we going, what are we doing after this segment? I don't know, if, are we supposed to ask Jerry questions now or no? Ah, uh, sure, rock on. Also, I don't know if Glenn was talking to us, but if he was, then he was muted. If not, uh, then he probably meant to be muted. Okay, fair enough. He was muted, I was typing and okay. talking. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, um, Jerry, obviously the GP is coming up this weekend. I'm going. Um, preferred archetype. If you can get one, like I'm thinking about forcing on day two because that's what I always do. Uh, and there's been a lot of like, uh, well, don't you laugh at me. There's been a lot of uh, like kind of some shit talking of Simic uh, among like the pro what? community or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's just that's just what I've heard. 
Um, and I think, like, you know, Ben has had his interview where he's like, you know, Orzov's the best deck. And I think, you know, obviously a lot of people are going to put a lot of stock on what Ben has to say when it comes to limited. And I think it's very clear that Boros is a super good deck, but I feel like, you know, that's a deck that a lot of people are going to draft. And then no one really knows how to draft a mirror. And God knows I'm not going to touch any of those cards unless I open, like, a consuming aberration. Um, so, like, do you have, like, any, any strong feelings one way or the other on, like, the limited format? Like, just, like, drafting it? Like... Am I am I crazy for wanting to draft Simic or forcing it, or like what are your like real thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. The first one is that Simic is like the only one that had by far a higher than fifty percent win percentage in our drafts. Okay. It was it was like thirty and seventeen or something, and everything else was close to fifty fifty. Okay. So I I like Simic a lot. I like the one drops. I think they're insane. Like the the only problem is that like you don't have a lot of ways to break up things. So, like, if they just go to, like, Blood Rush kill you, like, there are only so many cards that you can have. You know, just, like, uncommon Simic Charm or whatever. So that kind of sucks. But for the most part, your cards are, like, relatively overpowered. You have guys with giant asses like Croconora that just, like, brick wall all the beatdown decks and stuff. And if you have a one-drop in a land to play it, like, your deck's probably insane. So uh, I do like that. I think forcing is just stupid, though. Like, why would you ever force... Okay, hold on a second. It's 2013. Okay. And you've known me since 02? Oh f- no. I know, but like in this format <laughs> specifically, like, okay, there's, it's not, it's not like there's 10 color combinations, right? Like sure. there's, there's five color combinations because there's only five guilds. Like basically you're all drafting monocolored decks. Sure. Okay, so it makes way less sense now because if you're like, well, I'm going to force blue white in OTJ or whatever and they're blue black, okay, whatever, you still have a deck. But like, if you're just like, all right, second picking Shamble Shark, third pick, uh, there's nothing, I'll take this four mana 2-4 or whatever, and then you just get cut off, like, you have nothing. You get no deck whatsoever, and you're leaving yourself with no options. So I'm kind of a psycho. I understand uh, that you are, but you could also just learn how to draft before the tournament. <laughs> Look, man, I got three days left here, okay? I got three days left, and I take this, uh, I kind of take this psycho approach of, you know, just keep forcing, and I think that the other people will back down before I do. You the people to you my right, don't my left. get four points per match win for being a psycho. You're not playing chicken in a draft. Like everyone else at the table is just I as play, stupid as you. They're not going to figure it out. <laughs> I play chicken all the time. That's how I got 16th in Philly, just by forcing Rakdos. And the people next to me finally backed <laughs> off. The guy I don't think they backed off. I just thought that those are the better cards, and you just had a deck every time. Still, that's not how this format works. Like, I don't know, man. I've been doing this for a really, really long time. I don't really like to do like the you know draft what's open and then like read the table okay. on sense. Right. I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm word, just saying word. that's on draft. Said, here's the thing: if this is what you're gonna do, and you're not gonna back down, and you're you're uh, defense for this is just I'm a psycho and I like being a psycho. Don't ask my opinion. Right, that's because <laughs> if you don't like the answer, then it doesn't really matter if you're not going to back not, down. Well, I'm not. I'm okay with the answer. I just want to know like what the good archetypes are. Like so the know, real like, question is, are you just going to wear a shirt or not? Because like at that point, I probably would wear the shirt. The Tarot is faithful shirt. Yeah, just yeah. like I'm drafting Simic. Get the fuck away from me, <laughs> like. Dude, your yeah, guilt, your colors, your shirt, <laughs> buy one. I mean, is that even that bad? Like, we all know, like, you don't want to be downwind of somebody in your guild. Like, it's pretty bad. So, like, if there's any time to break break out a shirt, it might be this format. Yeah, I mean, like, at the, at, at the like, the GP or whatever, like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, like, two or three people at each of my tables were just like, oh, you only draft Rakdos. Like, AJ was at my table, like, two seats from me, and he's just like, yep, I can't. Cause... Yeah, but there's a lot of morons and people that like either don't know that you like Simic or don't care or don't know how to draft to begin with and like you're going to want to adapt like you're just leaving yourself with no other options which seems very poor okay so shirt templating I'm thinking fuck you I'm green blue perfectly <laughs> reasonable I, can get, I have a shirt distributor and I can just make these shirts well, actually this is a green blue one I'll just have to make it like instead of charcoal it's green and blue right there when you sit yeah. down just point just yeah, this here, right here. This is what I'm doing. Yeah, that's what I have to do. Obviously, like you know, like I, I, it's not like I'm 100% sold on forcing, but I haven't gotten a lot of drafts in, and I was just, more, more of my question are just like you know, like Ben said that like Orzov is like the best deck. Um, I've heard like varying opinions on 
like Simic. Some people say it's like really good. Some people are like, you know, borderline undraftable um, or like super hard to get. And I've heard that like Boros is like super overdrafted. So like I put a lot of stock in that particular information to like figure out what people do and don't like. That's okay. that's my that's more of my question. Two more things. A, you have to get through sealed deck first to even yeah. get to the draft portion. I've done a lot of those over the past. Okay, week. cool. So, so you step, know how random step, it is. Step one is complete. Step two is um, if you if you haven't done any practice drafts, then like forcing a thing doesn't really matter, right? Like, do you know how to draft Simic? Because that seems um, like the thing that matters the most here. Well, now I do. After doing it all day yesterday, I have a very good idea of how I want to go about drafting Simic. Okay. Now, do I know how to draft the other archetypes in it? No. Like, that's what I'm planning on doing the rest of the week. It's just, like, trying to figure out how to draft Boros, trying to figure out how to draft Orzhov, that sort of thing. But, like, my, 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 like, overarching question is just, like, you know, are one of these, like, better than the other? Are some people, like, some people are saying, like, Demir is horrible, and then you've got, like, Tom Ross over here being, like, Demir's the best guild, you're all stupid, Prophetic Prism is the best common in the set. Like, am I the moron? Is he the moron? Like, I trust your opinion more than I trust Tom Ross's. Like, that's that's a thing. But he's the boss. I would not trust my opinion over Tom Ross's. Anything that he is, like, passionate about to say is the truth, and he's, he's just completely unwavering, he's probably right. As long as you know what he knows. Like, if he's saying Prophetic Prism is the best or Demir's the best, he knows a lot of stuff that you don't know. Yeah, that's, so that's to, how I feel, too. To, to hear him, like, make some sweeping generalization like that, it seems ridiculous, but if if he, like you know, let you pick his brain or whatever, like, I'm sure you would realize, oh, hey, like, Demir's good. I mean, I know Conley was drafting Demir a bunch, and he was, like, doing well in our drafts, but it's also Conley, and he's ridiculous, so, you know, yeah. play Demir at your own risk. Most of the time, it ends up like a bad Orzhov deck. Yeah, like, that's that's just like, like, just like your basic experiences or whatever. I know you won 5-1 at the PT, and both your decks looked like they were pretty good, but I'm sure you did, like, you know, probably like 15 or 20 drafts beforehand, so that's yeah, all. Yeah, on Moto, plus, yeah. like, the other 10 we did in the house. Yeah, and, like, sure. All the so, discussion and stuff, yeah. Plus, the format's you. straightforward. Like, you honestly don't have to do that much work. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really seem that difficult for, like, how I like to play Magic, which is just, like, a curve and tricks and beat the shit out of you. Like, it doesn't yeah, okay, really seem you like got it's, it. It does, yeah, it doesn't really seem like it's, like, overly difficult, but, like, you know, I've, I've, I've heard, like, 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 like I said, like, the Tom Ross thing is, like, very jarring. Because, like, when he's concrete about something, it's just, like, I mean, you haven't played Magic in, like, three years, and now, like, you're writing articles on Channel Fireball that are saying, like, Demir's the best deck, and, like, Prophetic Prism... Saying Prophetic Prism is the best common in the set is, like... What? Like, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of hyperbole there, and it's only in certain circumstances. You know, you have to be drafting this Travis Wu deck or whatever. I assume that's what he's talking about. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he's first picking Prophetic Prism for his Demir deck, is he? Yeah, just, like, I, I don't that'd, know. Like, just, <laughs> that'd be a little strange, but... Yeah, just, like, on Facebook, his status is just, like, Prophetic Prism best common and i'm just like what's going on like what don't i know but like, this is a cantripping mana fixer that's all i see this card as so. it's in the same way as kid king is the most powerful constructed deck that's ever been built cedric it's true that's my reason it's very true all right that's my only question for now all and right. i hope you're enjoying your pepperoni pizza I like that we keep disrupting the pepperoni pizza. Like, it comes up, and then it goes down, and then... Yeah, you can't yeah. stop. All right. Do you, do you guys have have questions for Jerry so we can continue to beat up his pizza? Like, Glenn, do you want to... Cedric suggested sure. we, we rotate. I'm, I'm down with that. And then uh, potentially take some from chat. Are you... Do we yeah. want to get that rolling now? Is that okay with you, Jerry? I guess Jerry? Go, ahead and, go ahead and tell the chat to start asking things. But I do have a question. Uh, you mentioned, like, obviously you guys wound up all playing some relatively diverse strategies for the Pro Tour, and you mentioned, like, you know, Conley, or, sorry, Ephra, like, kind of developed his Naya deck alone for the most part, and Conley obviously went and played the Mono Black deck. Uh, were there any decks that got, like, A, I guess, how did you guys wind up just splintering so much, uh, and B, did you end up discarding any decks? Like, did nobody, did you have a deck that you decided just wasn't good, but uh, that wound up in retrospect seeming better? Uh, I, th I think the Jund Aggro deck I had was pretty good, and I was kind of onto something, but no one really wanted, no one was invested, right? You know, like, they all sure. get high on a deck, and then they stick with it for a while until something better appears, or they start losing with it, or whatever. Uh, we, we played some with the Spirit deck that top-aided the first open, 
Uh, that deck was kind of interesting. We fixed it up a little bit, but that was like one of those things where like they kept playing games against it because they thought people might play it. I suggested favorable wins, and people were like, okay, yeah, that seems like a reasonable card, but it like never made its way into the deck. And then Shuhei got a, a deck that was similar to the White Black Zombie deck off like some Japanese forum or something. And that was the first time I ever saw like creature combat with Cartel Aristocrat, and I thought that was pretty good. So uh, the t Team SCG deck was not really a surprise that you know like that card was playable or whatever. But um, we played Reanimator for like four games. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like everyone had things that they liked. You know, like uh, people like Web and uh, Web and Raptor. Web and Ocho are the same person. In case you guys can catch that. And so, like, Webb and Raptor and Shuhei, they'd just be, like, the punching bag with Jund. And, you know, Shuhei was thinking about playing Jund, but eventually, like, him and Ben S were just like, yeah, we'll play Esper. And Ben S even said, like, Blue, White, Red might be better, but he just loves drowning people too much. So, I don't know. Like, everyone just got attached to a deck and then did whatever because there was no consensus. Like, all the cards were good. I... We, we didn't really have, like, a metagame pinned down or anything, and so it wasn't like, oh, well, Esper's definitely better against this metagame or whatever. It was just like, oh, we like these cards. They're sweet. All the decks are sweet, so... That, that's actually really interesting. One, one of my friends was playing his first Pro Tour this weekend, and he wound up getting 24th, so kudos, uh, Joe Demestrio. And he was, you know, really worried about teams developing decks that, like, he didn't have or, like, just breaking the format or whatever, uh, because in the WoW TCG, which he plays, that's, like, not that uncommon. But the biggest piece of advice I gave to him, which I guess seems like pretty mirrored by your testing, was like just guarantee that you have a good deck, and then play it well. And like yeah. if you can guarantee that, like that's as much as you really can hope for at a pro tour. Yeah, I agree with that. For the most part, like new decks don't get broken. You know, like Sam Black, being the genius that he is, managed to build an entirely new deck. But uh, for the most part, we're just working on tuning existing decks and finding out a strategy that's good. You know. So if yeah if, if your if your buddy has a good deck and he knows that like Esper is a deck you know like he's not going to run into too many surprising things, uh, although there, I guess there was like some shenanigans with people building like Turbo Fog decks and Omniscient decks and unexpected yeah. old decks and the results were expected so <laughs> it's not very good. That's a B. No, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, my first question is. Uh, did you feel that you did anything differently at this Pro Tour than at the other ones, or did you feel that you did everything the same and just ran better? Uh, for Limited, it was, like, the exact same, except my opponents just died. You know, like, I, I had two very solid Boros decks. They did nothing remarkable. Like, one of my Limited matches was on camera, and he's just playing, like, mediocre creature after mediocre creature, and I'm just like, okay, you're dead. I, like, mulled a five and beat him a game. And, like, normally that doesn't happen. I go, like, 3-3 three, three or 4-2 in Limited. Uh, instead of five and one, so uh, definitely got pretty lucky there, and then just played against like a bunch of normal decks like Naya and stuff that I've played against a million times. Had a deck that I liked a lot. Like if I got to play Cobblade or a real Delver deck in a PT, then I think you know the the same thing could have happened. But instead, I played like Sam Black's crappy Spirit deck because I was convinced that it was better because, you know, I let him talk to me or whatever, but... <laughs> Never again. Like, Costa's Delver deck, or, like, any of the blue-white Geist Delver decks I played before, like, I can almost guarantee I top-8 that tournament, but I also, like, attacked a blood Craze Neonate into a 2-3 when I had, like, the Captain in my hand and just didn't play it because I thought my guy was just going to get suicided anyway. So I, like, <laughs> threw away a match in Limited. I, dude, I don't know. I was not invested in that Pro Tour whatsoever, I can tell you that much, but I, I got, like, 25th there. And, but it just like I got I got lucky to not get unlucky is basically it, and I had draft decks that were good and a constructed deck that's good. All right, Stephen, do you have anything for us? Yeah. So the last time, okay, I like I admire your animated spirit in playing Magic, and you seem to like really enjoy it, whether you're winning or losing. Uh, last time I saw you was at San Francisco at Worlds, and you were like out of contention already, but still like beating up Constructed and really having a lot of fun. And so I'm sort of interested to hear how it felt to be winning and doing very well. Like, how are your emotions? Where were you? So I've I've been X and one after day one at a PT before, 
and then just like completely bombed out. And that was in Amsterdam. It was like mirrored in Block Limited. So after going seven one, it's like okay, you know, not really that big of a deal. And then I three zero my pod, and I'm just like running around the room, like looking for people to talk to. I'm just like, uh, uh, Efro, tell me how to not fuck this up. And he's like, I don't, I don't know, man, just don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, fine, like, muse. I'm, yeah. I'm just like, Kibler, Kibler, how, how do I not fuck this up? And he's just like, dude, just keep doing what you're doing. Just like, no one had anything profound to say whatsoever. And like, I really like these two spirit guides for, for your sample size. <laughs> like, yeah, I, well, the two you went to were just the pretty divorced. I wanted like, someone like Jason Ford or Ben Hayes, uh, probably not Josh Cho, because, you know, he would have said the same thing as them or whatever. Uh, Huey would have been a good one, but none of these people were there, you know, so I'm just like, okay, who do I talk to? Uh, so it was definitely on my mind, and I've I've also crashed and burned, like, from being 11-1 and a bunch of GPs and stuff, so uh, it was on my mind, but I don't think it, like, made me nervous or anything. Like, I, I was more calm and collected during this tournament than I have been for any Pro Tour. Like, maybe that had something to do with it. I'm not sure, but uh, normally, like, round one... It, it feels kind of weird. Maybe it was because I had to draft first both days. I don't know. But it's like I normally need to shake the rust off first. So I've lost a lot of round ones at Pro Tours and stuff. But I don't know. All my losses felt like I got unfortunately unlucky. Um, but, again, I didn't get unlucky in the other ones I won. So it was, like, kind of frustrating after when I started losing in Constructed. Like, I lost to Melissa in a matchup that I think is good, and then I lost to Roberto in a blue-white-red matchup that I, I think is good, especially after he, like, wrathed away his own guys. Um, yeah, I guess I said that before the show, huh? Yeah, yeah. They, did, they didn't get so, that. Yeah, so he had Geist and Angel, and I was at 7, so I'm just dead on board, draw my car for the turn, No, I'm dead on board, and then I just attack with two Snapcasters instead of conceding. And he's just like, oh, crap, he has Blasphemous Act and, like, does all the math. And he's like, I have to block, otherwise I die. So he, like, blocks with his guys, untaps, attacks with his angel, and then Supreme Verdict's away, like, my Reckoner his angel when I'm at four. And he, like, he, he was mana screwed, didn't have a red source, and then the game went on for forever, and I, I died. And it's just, like, that stuff was frustrating, but, like, just didn't get to me, you know? And, like, I don't know if I was being, like, self-sabotaging and uh, trying to actively think about this stuff. Or if I was trying to just, you know, like, fight it, basically, by, like, trying to talk to people about it. I don't know. I can't explain stuff like this. Like, it felt like a normal tournament to me. It was not anything different. And, yeah. And then All Swedish right. beat the crap out of me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who, realistically, who can beat the hair? Is the question. Uh, um, apparently Martel. Just yeah. that's it. That's it. Um... Two quick questions for you, and then we'll kick it over back to Glenn and the rest of the guys. Um, one, how big of a deal was Boris Reckoner, like, in your testing? Like, did you basically come to the conclusion of, you know, like, if people aren't playing this card, like, they're just out of the loop? Like, I know, like, Barcelona testing or whatever, uh, I was helping Berkeley get ready for that tournament, and it was like, if you're not playing, like, Silverheart, like, you just have no idea, like, what's going on in the format or whatever. Like, was Reckoner basically, like, the same way? Yeah, pretty much. It started with Saito's deck. And then it was like, oh, man, this card is so good in Saito's deck. And then we're like, oh, well, let's build this blue-white-red deck. And then we cast it against Saito's deck, and they just could not win. Yeah. It's just, like, impossible. If they spear it, they're wasting their turn. You're killing their other guy. They're so far behind. And it, it felt like that for every deck. So, yes, that, that card is it's pretty absurd as long as there is creature combat. Okay, uh, and just the second one, basically a, an emotion question. Um, I know that, like, when I was in Kyoto, you were there... Um, kind of talking to me in between rounds, actually, like, after I won. I remember when I beat uh, Shouta, and, like, the match only took, like, 12 minutes, but I came up to you, and I tried to act like I was mad, and you were just like, you crushed him, didn't you? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you just saw right through me, like, immediately. Um, and then, like, I top-aided, and, like, you were the first person, like, I ran up to and hugged or whatever. Like, what did you do after you top-aided? Like, just, like, what are the emotions for you? Because, like, I remember mine, like, pretty well. It was just, like, it's like pretty like a pretty unreal feeling. So, um, like and I know like this is a thirty third PT. I don't know if like it was like a like a wash of like thank God this was finally over or like complete joy or like did you go through anything specific that you remember? I was just very happy. I wasn't like relieved like thank God this is over or whatever. Like I'm, I was way more positive about it. 
you know, like I was just genuinely happy, but it was kind of weird because like the coverage was all right there. So immediately after I beat this guy, like there's just like a lot of applause and I haven't been looking on the rail or anything. And then I like look up and see all these people, you know, Caitlin's there and um, Tim Willoughby has me do an interview right in front of the table. Well, the, the Italian guy is there de sideboarding. So he's just <laughs> like, Oh, Jerry, like you just won your match. You're probably in top eight. Like, how does that feel? Like it sure would have sucked to lose this match. <laughs> and, <laughs> And then, a- and then after that, I had, uh, like, Rich and BDM take me backstage and stuff. So I didn't even get to, like, talk to people or, like, uh, you know, get any hugs or do any of that stuff. And I know that when when Cho won his match playing for uh, the top eight of PTAVR, like, we ran from the room and just, like, broke through the blockade thing and, and just, like, hugged. And that was it. You know, like, he didn't even get a chance to get stolen away. So. Sure. Yeah, that was cool. But me, I just like got pulled backstage, and then eventually came out, and people were like, "Oh, did you win?" I don't even know. So, but yeah, actually, the next round, uh, Efro plays the guy in the same seat, and then Tim does the same interview with him too. Like, "Oh, you just won playing for top eight. How's it feel?" And then that time, he just like grabbed all his stuff and, and walked away. The Italian guy. Did. Yeah, that's so, completely fair. Kind kind of awkward, but yeah. Yeah, obviously, Glenn doesn't care. <laughs> I mean, you didn't need to sideboard for the next round, so it makes sense. That's true. That's very true. There. Anybody else? Glenn, you want to go next? Uh, I'm I'm good. Do we have Do we want to start throwing the chat or? I have one more question. All right. Okay, sure. I want to know what your worst play of the tournament was. All right. So normally, when people say like I didn't make any mistakes, I just berate them, right? Oh well, man, because it seems reasonable. You ran perfect. Because that's just a ridiculous thing to say. But no, like, there are definitely things that I could have done differently, but I don't think I did anything horrendous. Um, I I know that there's, like, probably a thing or two that is worse than these, but, like, my game three against Melissa, I could have mulliganed. I mulliganed a very similar hand game one because it didn't have enough lands, and then I just, like, didn't play a third land or whatever and died. Um, so that one was just kind of like... Um, if if I was smarter and actually like stopped to think about it, then I would do it. But like for the most part with this deck, uh, it's like, I can play it in my sleep, you know, like I'm just trying to not die. Eventually they die. It's like really not that hard for me. Um, uh, Oh, against Joel actually. So I have six lands and an auger and an angel, or I have an angel. I cast the auger. And then I attack with the angel, he charms it, and then I let that resolve and then play another angel. So I just, like, ship my angel to the bottom. And oh, to, wow. Yeah. So in my mind, I was like, oh, that's fine. I'll just play this angel next turn, play another angel, whatever. Like, I have this clock on him. But actually, the way the game played out, like, the angel would have just been terrible because he started casting, like, Sphinx's revelations, and I needed, like, basically my only... I needed another revelation to catch up. But if I'd angeled first... Uh, and then let the charm resolve, and then, you know, do that again. Like, maybe I can actually hit a revelation. I ended up never drawing a revelation after augering, like, three times and uh, going through a bunch of cards and stuff. So, yeah, that, that one probably cost me. And that sucks that it was in top eight, too, but I don't know. Otherwise, I think I did good. I, I'd say that's fair. All right, do you guys have any... Any particular favorite chat questions? I've seen a number of people ask what you think about Conley's mono black deck. We can go with that. Well, the other people, I task you with looking through the chat to see if there's anything exciting. I'm trying to eat pizza, and they want to ask me about Conley's mono black deck. This is what I'm getting distracted for. No. Uh, I, I, I told Conley like a couple nights before the tournament, since like no one else was invested in his deck, and I was pretty much set that if you want to talk about his deck, like I would. And... He's like, okay, cool. So we, we talked about a few things, and um, I, I don't actually know what list he ended up playing, but we talked about, like, the number of slaughter games he wanted, the number of, like, Rakdos returns, and, like, how he wanted to beat control because he thought he was good against aggro and stuff like that. And it seems like um, a kind of a worse Jun deck, but better in ways because you have things like Bristlebrand that you can power out on turn five and just, like, get free wins that way. So I... I could totally see this, like, maybe ending up being a better Jun deck, but he was also very slanted towards beating, like, Saito green-red decks with his Gloom Surgeons and stuff, which 
they're not very good against a bunch of other decks. So I don't know. Like that type of strategy certainly has merit, but I'm not sure. It's like it's not. It's definitely not what I would be doing. But for someone like Conley, like it doesn't really surprise me that he did well. You know. Um, I know that some people in the chat er, much earlier in the show were just wondering um, about you being on. Well, you being on like with Team CFB as opposed to being on SCG, uh, SCG, or like where's SCG Blue? Like, is there any way to just go about like explaining that situation for people who don't really understand it? So, I formed SCG Blue with a bunch of my friends that were qualified that lived in the area, namely like Josh Cho, Todd Anderson, Brad Nelson, and then <clears throat> it kind of expanded from there with uh, me inviting like my acquaintances who asked and then like their friends and third cousins and whatever. And then we ended up with like 22 people on the team. And now basically none of those people are qualified or they went to other teams like Matt Costa. So, uh, I was basically left with myself and Ali Antrazi for this tournament. So SCG blue is, is taking a break currently. And thankfully Luis asked me to test if I want to test with him. And we worked together like years ago, which I don't think a lot of people know. Because uh, a lot of people have, like, bragged to me about being friends with Luis and stuff like that. You know, they'll just, like, kind of drop these hints that, like, oh, you know, I know some pro people. Like, I'm cool, too. But it's like, sure, I'm actually good friends with him. Like, we used to talk all the time and stuff. So, uh, us working together is not that weird. Like, I'm, I'm pretty good friends with everyone. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly flattered that they asked because they are the best team and they have like the best track record in PTs as of late for sure. And it seems like they have everyone they need. Like Raptor basically does my job, but he also has a knack for deck selection, which I basically lack because I can select the best deck that I will play correctly, but I'm not going to ever choose to play Tempered Steel in a PT, for example. So uh, he certainly, he basically has me dominated as far as our skills are concerned. Um, so I was kind of surprised, but it was cool. Um, it worked out. They, they asked me to work with them again for San Diego, which I, I believe I'm going to do. It's, it's kind of weird with Brad being qualified now. I don't, I'm not sure what he's going to do, you know, but, um, I, I like all the people on the SCG team. It's just, I'm closer with the CFB guys. They're, they're like people that I would hang out with and talk to every day and stuff. And then the SCG guys are like people that I would talk to at the tournament, you know, but not necessarily hang the tournament, so it's just like that kind of different relationship, and like me and Luis go way back, so I mean, plus the best. I guess that helps, too. Um, I don't think there's too much more in the chat, just a lot of people like asking about deck, like deck questions, stuff like that, which I think your article will probably do a nice job of covering. Um, it goes up tonight, it has an updated deck list, talks about like the genesis of the deck and stuff like that. Uh, it's not like a tournament report or anything. And if people want to ask questions about the deck, uh, I, I usually answer them in the comments, except for ones that are just like, how do I against like these tests? Because it changes depending on what cards they have. So that, that question gets kind of annoying, but I understand where they're coming from, you know. Sure. All right, we got to roll out. Um, Adam, if you want to leave the shout-outs, we can do that. Yeah, let's, let us do the shout-outs. Um, how are we gonna do this? Yeah, Jerry, you can you can go last. We'll we'll leave you to your pizza. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, Cedric, why don't you lead us off? Okay. Um, this week for me, gonna be streaming Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Gonna have a special guest each day. Uh, I'm gonna be doing Gate Crash, Eight Fours, and Release Sealed. Uh, might play a little bit of Zoo and Modern, and um, might deal my opponents eight points of damage in Standard. <laughs> Um, that looks to be the plan for this week. I'll be in Charlotte this weekend. Glenn, you gonna be there? Yep, uh, that's coverage my shout out. Coverage or playing? <laughs> coverage. Ooh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll be at Charlotte this weekend for the GP. I'm playing for once. I haven't played in a tournament for a, li for a really long time. Um, so I'm actually gonna play for once this weekend. Um, and, uh, hopefully make day two. And... Do all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, I know some other members of uh, stream team will be there. MJ's going, Prozac's going, the guy who won the free flight to Charlotte on New Year's uh, from me is going. So uh, this should be a lot of fun. Uh, give Jerry a big hug, spit in his pizza. It'll be a good weekend. All right, Glenn. Yeah, I will also be at GP Charlotte doing coverage, as I just said. Uh, for those not aware, this event is Star City Games Grand Prix, and we're actually running the coverage. SCG Live will be doing everything for it. Our commentators, our coverage people, 
Uh, we've got a lot of prep work done for the show already. Plenty of cool stuff that will be airing both video and otherwise. Uh, obviously, the gold rush is happening. Uh, Quebec City is happening concurrently, so with the Wizards coverage team, we'll be up there. But SCG Live is taking over Charlotte. And I'll be flying straight from Charlotte to Vegas, where I'll be enjoying a nice, relaxing break before working another weekend. So <laughs> that is basically my plan for the next two weeks. All right. Steven. Sort of late, but if any of you guys have heard of the Collegiate Star League, which runs StarCraft and League of Legends tournaments through, um, throughout the U.S., Europe, and Asia now at universities, I went to the like semifinals and finals of the StarCraft tournament that they were running. They were held in L.A. over the weekend, and they were really cool. It's a really cool tournament. It's gotten a lot of support from the esports community, and if you are interested at all in StarCraft or League of Legends and want to see like sort of the grassroots university kids playing it, I recommend checking it out. Yeah, like I said, I, I went on Saturday, spent the day there chilling out, watching some video games, and had a lot of fun. So, something you guys might like to know about, I don't know. Uh, for the coming week, I'm going to be hanging out, eating food. I might drink a beer or two. Have a great life. <laughs> All right. And before we go to Jerry, I just wanted to say thanks for watching. I know we sort of rambled a little bit. Our show went a little bit long, but we had such a wonderful opportunity. And I want to thank Jerry for putting up with us on this You're show. You're welcome. Thanks for coming thanks, Jerry. by. Yeah. So... Uh, my pizza's cold, so that's kind of disappointing. But Suck it. I will also be in Charlotte this weekend. There is a little meet and greet on Friday. Glenn, does that start at 6? Do you have any idea? Well, I think yeah, Glenn's, himself, yeah, Glenn's on mute. Just being okay, okay, cool. Well, I think it starts at about 6, but check out the information for that. Uh, it's going to be me, Patrick Chapin, Mike Flores, Brad Nelson signing tokens for you guys. Brian Kibler could not... Uh, get there in time because he's flying from the West Coast and has a job like a big boy. But he will be there in the morning, and there will be plenty of tokens there for people and whatnot. Uh, and I, I think that'll be sweet. I'm a little worried that um, it's it's going to be hectic with my recent Pro Tour top eights. But I guess those are good problems to have. You're worried there's going to be a run on on Jerry tokens? Is that? No, I, I just think I'm not going to be able to, like, go smoke a cigarette or whatever. But, like, Brad said he went to Atlanta and just got mobbed. Like, everyone wanted him to sign tokens and stuff. Uh, but it's going to be cool. I'm going to try and keep them numbered. I'll probably forget, but <laughs> that's what I want to do. I signed one and two last weekend. It was sweet. Ooh. Collector's nice. items. Yeah. That's right. So that'll be cool. Charlotte will be fun. Uh, I think I'm doing two articles this week. I'm going to do... Um, one of the things where I go over a video of a game or a match or whatever and just do the, the breakdown. I don't know if you guys read the last one I did, but I thought it was pretty sweet. And crickets. So apparently no one, no one read that. Yeah, That's I read it. I read it. It was actually what a, Whatever, Cedric. Yeah, it's kind of hard. I mean, like, you messaged me about finding other games to do it with. It was, like, kind of hard to do, right? Like, there aren't a ton of games that you can do it with. Yeah. But when you, when you can, it's good. I mean, yeah. Sam, Black, Sam Black did one with me. Four years ago, or whatever. So I remember that. And yeah, Peter, cool. Peter Feldman was the innovator. But anyway, yeah. uh, my match against Melissa is the one that I think I want to do because I think that one's interesting enough. All right. I just wanted before we go. I just want to congratulate you on finally getting on my level. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. We both have pros or top eights. It's about time. <sighs> now it's now we can have like a raging debate on who's better between me and you since we have similar it's accomplishments. It's not going to be raging. <laughs> Uh, make it raging, okay? <laughs> Want to race the second Pro Tour Top 8, Cedric? Well, okay. Do we count the GPs for anything since you have 9 and I have 2? Do those no. count? Or Say those don't count. All my GPs, all my open series businesses, all my invitationals, yeah. those don't count. Okay, the, perfect. GPs, the GPs just prove, to, uh, prove how big a man you are, right? That's what I've heard. Yeah. From that's all, that's from all that is. Pardon? From who? I can't can't confirm my sources. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. so 
let's race it too. I have an unfair advantage because I'm queued for like the next five PTs or whatever. But no, no, I'll win a PTQ for this one because I really want to go and what I want to win a PTQ I normally do. So we can we can have a little race. Well, you queued twice happen. for like the the second last one, right? It was What's just that? you queued yeah, twice for the one yeah, two ago, right? And then twice for yeah. Pro Tour Seattle, yeah. And obviously no rollover. I don't expect there to be, but I'm actually been testing modern like a maniac, and I want to go to San Diego because San Diego's my favorite city in the U.S. So. I want to qualify for that. Slap that? No. Come on. All right. Thanks they for watching, everyone. We will see you guys later. Bye, guys!